Welcome to Boundless Pursuit, a weekly podcast providing motivation, entertainment, and education to anglers and outdoorsmen. I hope that the stories you'll find here will encourage you to chase your passion more fervently, to open your mind to new opportunities and perspectives. Your engagement and feedback is critical to the growth of this show, and I would love to hear your suggestions on topics or potential guests. You can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com or at my website, www.boundless-pursuit.com. That's where you'll find all related articles, media, and merchandise. Please remember, the show will gain traction from your support. Be sure to like, comment, and share this podcast to your friends and connections. I'm your host, David Graham. Now let's get on to today's episode. Today's guest is somebody that really embodies the spirit of the Florida man, and he's not even originally from this state. Dylan Eckmark moved to Florida almost entirely because of the diverse fishing scene that we have. It's something that I can relate to because I did pretty much the same thing. And he wasted absolutely no time setting his sights on targeted species and experiences, knocking out almost everything that this state has to offer in saltwater and freshwater. And what I love about Dylan, he favors the use of a canoe, where despite the limited room to maneuver, the horsepower, the electronics, he still routinely catches man-sized tarpon, goliath grouper, sharks, and all kinds of monster fish. And his approach to fishing out of something as humble as a canoe or simply going it on foot should be motivating to budget anglers who still want a piece of that kind of action. And in his new home waters, he's chasing all the typical inshore and nearshore species in saltwater like tarpon, redfish, snook, triple tail, sea trout all of those things. And in Florida's diverse freshwater scene, he's already conquered the whole gamut of native and non-native exotic species. And his experience as an angler has grown and evolved on this new home front to more ambitious endeavors far from home. And we talk about his recent trip to British Columbia, chasing the fabled monster white sturgeon of the Fraser River, fish in excess of 10 feet long. We talk future plans and dream trips. And we talk about passions aside from fishing altogether. Because Dylan is also part of the state's python program, where he's taken an active role in the control of Florida's invasive Burmese python population. And we just talk about his overall passion for pursuing and studying different kinds of reptiles and wildlife in general. And this is a dude that has traveled out of country into remote jungle, intentionally separating himself from what's known and what's familiar, all in the pursuit of different experiences in the wild. He's an angler. He's a reptile enthusiast. He's a hunter. He's just a jack of all trades wild. This is Dylan Eckmark. I don't have like a definitive starting point on these things. We just begin talking, but you know, I decide what's I decide what's the most interesting point to begin the video. But but anyway, you're sitting in an interesting spot. That's like, that's part of the fun of doing these podcasts. Is like seeing <laughs> snooping in people's houses. Yes, the what they have in the background. Counter, you yeah, <laughs> you know some some people have some interesting stuff going on. There's like unplanned cameos in the background you know <laughs> naked person walks by I'm like oh got it dude if we have a uh if we have an unplanned cameo in my background you're gonna see me literally <laughs> jumping out of my seat because it means like a 10 foot snakes loose oh, yeah that's, that's <laughs> what i was about to say so anybody who's uh only listening i got dylan eckmark here who's <laughs> a jack of all things florida man a jack of all <laughs> trades and all things florida man from dude the giant fish the different kinds of fish the reptiles, the wildlife. I've been a fan of seeing your stuff for a while now and even had the pleasure of joining you on one of these reptile hunts. But <laughs> I see the background. That was the first thing I thought. I'm like, man, if this dude has a cameo, I don't even want to know what's going to pop out at him. <laughs> uh, no telling, especially. The guy's especially got... Yeah. Uh, I, 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 how many of those trays back there, the gray ones, have something in them? Is that just where the food is or is that no, all... Those, bro. Every single one. This room, as we sit here, has like 105 snakes in it, maybe. That must be one of the friendly ones because you just willy-nilly opened it. I hope they're labeled. Yeah, yeah these ones These ones, I'm not too worried about. <laughs> oh, nice. So, yeah. yeah, but that's that's what pretty much all these tubs are filled with something similar to this. So. <laughs> oh, geez. They like it, though, man. That's, that's the way they like to live. 
that well he seemed happy he didn't go for your <laughs> eyeballs nah. or your throat just then but uh, I, I, if you if you wanted to see me get physically assaulted by a snake i've got many in here that would just tear my ass up but you know, yeah i try not to <laughs> <laughs> Some of them more well behaved than others. Well, well, that's awesome. I I try to like not get do, too distracted by that and stay as on topic as I got. I'm notorious for just meandering through these conversations, <laughs> trying to stay on topic. You know, ultimately, this is a fishing podcast, and and dude, I don't know, man. Yeah. you're you're a guy who, I think you got to Florida a little bit before I did. Maybe a, what year did you land in Florida? What year? Did you I landed in Florida the end of 20 like november 2019 okay yeah so i came man maybe the same year when did i get here around the same time oh it seems like a lifetime ago it's crazy it's only been like you know three and three years and some change well the difference is you and i'm gonna get into this a little bit later i want to get into the florida stuff that i'm gonna kind of start with some other stuff but like (laughs) like you i don't know how you did it it's like you you just (laughs) nailed all of like the florida bucket list like immediately so like i want to get into like some of how you pulled it off the planning that went involved in that but i think it's best to start with what's probably most fresh on your mind from a fishing standpoint and what's most eye-catching from your instagram page and that's the recent trip that you took. You you went to British Columbia, right? Oh, yeah, dude. The Sturgeon trip, bro. The Sturgeon trip. So I'm yeah. like, oh, my gosh. Now, I've done the white sturgeon thing, but you went to, like, the spot for these fish. The yeah. So, so tell me how the trip came together, what the planning process. Like, was there a connection there? Like, tell me about this yeah. Sturgeon trip. So, um. It was kind of all, last year was a hard year. Um, I have a, a friend, his name's Michael. He's my best friend my entire life. Uh, his dad passed away last year and uh, it hit us all really hard. But our entire lives, like Michael's dream fish, it's been a giant surgeon. Like I, I bring him down here, dude, and we'll go catch 150 pounds harpin and stuff. And it's cool, but it's like a week later, I'm hearing about sturgeon again, like ridiculous. So I decided yeah. like, th- this is the year we go. And, um, I knew a guy who we just kind of follow each other on Instagram. Uh, his name's Colby McKenzie and he's a guide and he lives up there. And I was like, man, I want to come do this. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to come back or if I'll have time. Cause there's so much going on. I was like, so I'm going to do it right. Like I want to fish for, for four days. Like, let's just go. And he was into it. So, I mean, we flew up there and it was just, the place is amazing. It's just, it's so funny. Like if you look at on a map from where you and I live, like you could not physically get further, further away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it was, it took me a day and a half to get there. It's literally from one corner to the other. Um, and as all good fishing trips go, we get there, we go out the next morning and it's like 35 degrees and just like blowing sideways rain, just absolute shit. So first day we caught like two sturgeon and they were like seven footers and uh, I let Michael reel them both in. I'm like, cool, man. Like, worst comes to worst. We came up here. We did it. You caught your fish. And then yeah. we proceeded to just, I, 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 I'm honestly, if you see me hunched over, it's almost, a, I don't know what, like a month later, my back is still messed yeah. up. I, yeah. caught, I caught 36 sturgeon over seven feet in three days. Oh, my gosh. That is a and grand caught, slam. And Michael caught, like, at least one. I mean, we caught two over 10 we caught probably a dozen nine footers i mean it was just and we had like we doubled up so many times and the, the literally the one time we doubled up i'm fighting a fish he gets on we had we had to fish one rod per person so it's me michael and then the guy cole but he's allowed to technically have a rod too so we have a third rod and i'm like yo reel that rod up we gotta get the line out the way as we're rolling the bait up it gets crushed again by a giant so literally had to bring these two <laughs> fish in unhook them and then deal with this it was just like pure madness and then uh he called me like two days after we got home and was like man i don't know what happened but the bites are like i've had to cancel trips so i don't know somebody just get lucky oh that because that's what i was wondering like is, is that like normal numbers like that's outrageous no i mean from based on what he's telling me like the size is normal i mean yeah. catching an eight to nine foot ten foot surge like that's that happens you know pretty much daily but you're talking maybe like two fish two to four fish if, you're, if it's a good day yeah so, yeah, I mean, that is like, I feel like that is like the purest experience of sturgeon fishing. And I think a lot of it is like the all encompassing experience because obviously the fish, they get bigger. Yeah. There's more of them, but it's also like the topography of 
that area. I'm assuming you're around like the Chilliwack area of the Fraser yeah. River. Yep. I, I mean, mean it's like you got the, Yeah. The mountains, the gorges, like that's big scary water too. Like I I've, I've seen the videos. I'm like, ooh, that's like intimidating looking water. I'm gonna be honest with you. It, it's like so we're area we were fishing was anywhere between like forty and eighty feet deep. It's fast. Yeah. It's fast. Like there he uses uh like twenty four ounce weights. I mean, big Jeez. chunks of lead. So it's it's kind of funny too, because it's like the most simple style of fishing, but it's it's difficult. And it's there's mm-hmm. a lot like, there's a lot of nuance to it because you're just running a nylon leader to a, a big sharpened barbless circle hook with a yep. giant freaking weight and some bait. Like it's as simple as it gets, but you know, the leader length, I guess, makes a difference. The way the weight sits makes a difference. They, you, whether on uh, this spot we're using square weights or this spot we're using round weights and then mm. the type of bait. Okay. If they're in a lower Fraser, they won't eat this. But if you go in the upper Fraser, they won't touch it. They won't. I mean, so it's like, it's just kind of wild to see something that on paper, it's like, I'm going to chuck bait out some yeah. stinky bait and catch fish that you know eats by smelling but in reality um you know it's just it's a lot more difficult than that yeah for sure i'm sure there's parallels between you know what my experience was and what yours was but it's also just like worlds apart because you know you got land like a, a landlocked population in idaho and then you have like the pure strain yeah. up there that are i'm, I'm guessing still jealous, though, man i mean it, like you and I are the same way and i like if I can do it by paddle craft, I'm doing it by paddle craft. Mm-hmm. I promise you if that river was paddleable and fishable, I'd have been trying to do it out of a kayak. Yeah. Um, I like doing land based. So I, w- watching you catch those giants, that giant surgeon in the pictures you got, like land based, man, like I was extremely jealous. That was yeah. freaking awesome. Well, we, we tried the kayak thing and, and shout out to the guy that helped me. It was co- sort of the same thing. Like, you know, you meet these people through another person organically because just other passionate fishermen like real yeah. fishermen and uh this guy steve carroll who i'm trying to get on the podcast i gotta get him on here but he's a he's a busy busy man but um he's he's sort of like pioneered the or certainly put on the map the kayak fishing for sturgeon scene out there in idaho which is like wild the guy's got wild videos of these nine foot yeah, sturgeon dude. jumping beside the kayak it's like I mean, nothing it's- yeah but but there's also something just whether you're in a boat or not, like when you're when you're around that environment where the nature's so powerful, it's like I don't know, man. That's I I I have gone way down the rabbit hole of <laughs> spending countless hours watching the videos of the of the Fraser River sturgeon. It's just like, man, that is like the the purest experience. The big cascading cliffs coming down and like yeah. the mist coming it's, off of it. And I just I saw black bears. All I was missing was a grizzly. That's like the only thing I was yeah. like, just a grizzly going through the background, man. Like this is this is like the screensaver fishing trip. But yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Like, I think I'm biased. Um, I'm harder to I'm harder to please living in Florida because you know if you got a guy who lives in the Midwest and he catches trout and stuff, like catching a sturgeon, he's gonna remember like that's like the biggest thing he's ever done. Yeah, we catch giant fish every day so i was under the assumption that like this would be cool uh i catch some big fish get some neat like see that just the whole experience but, like maybe the fish wasn't gonna you know blow my socks off but some of the surgeon absolutely kicked me in the dick like they yeah. fight <laughs> so they fight way harder than i than i expected and yeah. i show up and, and the guy's got avet like avet reels and phoenix rods and i'm like oh my like i feel like i'm at home i feel like i'm gruber fishing yeah and i was like you know no, no harness, no nothing, just like a rubber butt or like a little fight plate. Like we're going to horse these things. And I mean, I did it that way for every single one, but man, there was a couple of them that I, if I could have cut the line tapped out, I would have like, just, dude. Like, I, uh, oh yeah. That's what I was going to ask because you know, you're so accustomed and we'll get into like something, well, obviously the, the, you know, the Florida fish that you get with the yeah. Goliath, Goliath, you know, the fish that have some stature to them, like go- the Goliaths that you catch and the tarpon. And obviously you caught, giant sharks and stuff but i was gonna i was wondering you know obviously you know saltwater fish are they're always gonna be more powerful than a freshwater fish but but i was curious like your impression of the sturgeon just eat obviously there's nothing to compare them against in freshwater they're just too too no i mean in in my brain at this point i'm just considering i'm a saltwater fish on the fraser at least because like that's and and uh I, I, there's not a lot like they fight just like a big shark man i mean yes. it, not like a lemon or something that's gonna just roll around like dude they were peeling drag i mean you you real this you're in 100 feet of water so you gotta you're starting your your battle at 100 feet of line minimum 
Um, yeah. You get them up, you get them up to the boat and think you have them beat. They'd get one look at the daylight and they'd peel two, 300 yards of line with just nothing. You just crying. There's nothing you can do about it. Just, oh, I know. <laughs> you know well, what, what's, and what's amazing too, is when you think of a fish that big, like, and that just, that kind of shoulders behind it. And then mine didn't jump. I don't know if it's something to do with being on land. I, I really <laughs> wanted to see mine jump. But the idea that a fish like that would leave the waters, an, another thing. They like do. It. They do. The The biggest one we caught, uh, it was over 10 foot. I was fighting it. Um, and the other rod was going off and it was peeling line. And I was like, oh, that's a bigger fish. I yeah. got to get this one in. So I start thinking it's like a seven, eight foot fish. I'm, I'm really just, I'm, I'm fighting it not the way I would fight a fish I want to take pictures of. Yeah. It's, it's, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Just You're just ripping it, you know, pulling up, rolling down as fast as you can. And all of a sudden, I'm like, it's come up to the boat, and this thing jumps directly behind the boat, and like two thirds of its body came out the water, and we all just went silent. Yeah, and I immediately, Colby, like immediately, because we were anchored, you know, and Colby immediately, I just hear the anchor, just the anchor chain coming up. He's like, no, 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 we gotta go, we gotta go, like, like get screw all this other shit, like we gotta focus on this fish. Right. And then, <laughs> and then it got real, and that was that was like probably a 35, 40 minute fight. And, yeah. Uh, af- after that point, I mean, those those big sturgeon, even the seven footers, man. I mean, I gained a lot of respect for them. I always yeah. think I'm huge into reptiles, anything prehistoric. Like I thought, I just think they're the coolest thing ever. But after fighting one, I'm like, these guys who talk about them not fighting hard, I, I don't know what what they're basing it off of because I fight some pretty ridiculous stuff, and they they're up there for me. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I don't know, man. It's it's hard to not be impressed by again. Yeah, like you said, the prehistoric thing. It, it it was a fish that left an immediate impression on me. It was funny, like when I hooked mine, and and you mentioned this too. I in the back of my mind, I think it was as close as I've ever come to asking for help on the rod. I was like, I, I yeah. can't do it. I cannot ask for help. I can't be that guy. But it, I got like, it was it got bad. And I was like, if this thing comes up and I ask for help and it's only like a seven foot fish, I'm going to look so, because st- I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to measure it off of. Like it's the first one. Well, it's the second one I'd ever caught. I mean, no, I don't have enough experience to know what I'm dealing with. I'm like, is it, are, are, do they really fight this hard? Or like, do I actually have a giant? I'm like, so I had no idea. So I was like, I just stayed quiet. I suffered in silence, but yeah, man, I was done after one. I can't imagine catching that many. So, I was like, I'm like out said, of here. I'm finished. The first day I didn't even fight a fish. Uh, so I was like, okay. But my, Michael was like, man, they fight hard. And they look like they fought hard. And yeah. that second day after catching like a dozen of them, I got out of bed the third morning and was like, I couldn't even stand up straight. I was like, oh, this is going to be a really long day. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I told Michael right off the bat, I'm like, yeah, man, like you get the first fish. And then the second fish came like less than three minutes later. And I was like, all right, well, you know. So it's it's nice though. Like I mean, how many trips do you get to go on where you're, you're like you're in physical pain from catching fish? Like you oh, just I know. Suck <laughs> yeah. yeah. Usually, yeah, all, so. all my fishing problems are usually the opposite of that. But you manage to come away with like phenomenal photos too. Like I always appreciate somebody that like obviously you want to be smart with them. I feel yeah. like they're pretty. They're pretty like like they're pretty photo easy fish though. It's like, it's not like a tarpon. That's like you can't you don't have no, time to be God. screwing around. It's like. Uh, I I mean, mine put up a little bit of a fight when, like you know, I, you probably saw the same thing I did. Where the, when they when they're upside down, they're just like out. out it's like done. It's like it's pretty awesome. It's pretty convenient, man. Mine as soon as I rolled it over, though, it was like it came back on. It was like every slow move of its head was just like it was moving my whole. I mean, I weigh one hundred ninety five pounds. It was just moving yeah, me man. out of the way like I wasn't there. I was like, oh my god. When we like, when we got, got them into the shallows in the shallows that like you get a, you get an opportunity to get a nice picture of them because they kind of like sat still yeah um, but unlike you know the tarp and some other stuff to revive I think they just kind of like almost self revive because it would get to yeah. a point where like your your photo op's done like whether you're whether you want to get more photos or not the fish is done and it's going to go where it wants to go yeah and uh, they have a bunch of rules up there about not being able to take the head out of the water and stuff yeah, so yeah. I I got one super cool photo. Um, where, but by the way, the water was like fucking ice cold. It was freezing. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I, I went out to like chest deep and I had the fish like up on my chest under my chin. And you can tell like the head is like as wide as my shoulders. I'm, I'm six one. I'm a big guy. You know, yeah. it was just like, you know, you can't, you can't do that with a shark or something because you're going to get tore up. But I was like, right. man, this, <laughs> you know, this is like the moment, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. It was the same thing. I was so like pooped at the end of mine as like, 
I knew that I, I, you know, there's such an uncertainty in those kind of trips. Like, wh- when is the next time I'm going to be able to experience something like that? So yeah. even though I was like totally done and tired, I'm like, I know I've got to get a few memorable shots and then send this thing out. But um, yeah, dude, it's crazy fish. It's like I wanted to know like your experience of it, and you got even big. Mine, mine was big for Idaho standards, but you got to tangle with the real, the real giants. And I was, yeah, I was and, like, uh, die, yeah. Uh, the Fraser is just full of them, man. Like I know they yeah. come in waves and they they're following the salmon. Um, but we'd be anchored up fishing, and even though like we're catching fish, you're watching fish just jump like around you, like yeah. they're almost like you're salmon fishing, but they're they're eight nine foot long fish just going airborne all around you. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I imagine it's probably like the you know I'm, I've seen the videos you've seen, you've seen them like the Florida surge where people are just boating get taken out, you know, like it definitely oh, yeah. had that, that kind of feeling to it. Yeah, that's terrifying. No, ours uh, we we would see a few of them almost like roll. Um, it's you know it's probably a little bit of a different environment, but um, I all I know is like I was surprised by how savvy they were. You know, some fish like they'll take and they'll go, they'll fight against the current, like they'll swim up river. Our, my mind put the current behind its shoulders and started heading down river. I'm like, this is bad. I got spin gear. I'm like, I'm 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 not stopping this fish. Yep. But, um yeah there's a couple of them like so we obviously um our guy colby's got really good side scan and everything we'd be fighting a fish and we'd be you're, you're, you know you pull up the anchor on a big fish and you're floating with them down the current and he'd be looking at that side scan and he'd be like oh we got a, we got a big tree up here like 80 feet to our right and sure as shit man those fish just had like they're really like they're looking for structure when they're hooked for sure and if you know Maybe it's just that area. Maybe it doesn't happen in others, but that area for sure. If there's structure on the bottom, they're trying to get under it, and you can feel it. And like, I mean, I, we did lose a couple in the trees because, like, they find it. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, because that yeah. area's big on logging. So you, the, I think there's a lot of treetops on the bottom, and it's, it's they go right for it. Oh yeah, smart. They're smart fish. They're very smart fish. Yeah, and if even if it's not that, there's like underwater like canyons and rock edges and stuff. That's what we were contending with too. But um, yeah, man, yeah, I don't know. You can't get on top of them because you're on from the bank. So if there's a ledge, you're gonna be rubbing on it. Yeah, right? yeah, oh yeah. But um, yeah, dude, I I love how you describe kind of like the impulsivity of the trip, though. It's like, you know, you I w- I would love to see more people doing that. Like, there just, just comes a point in time where you have to just stop talking about these trips. And be like, you know what? But like and the time, is, the time is yeah. now. Yeah. And it's like you hear motivational speakers that like say that stuff. I'm like, okay, jackass. Like, oh, just <laughs> just go and do it. But it's like all the best trips I've ever been on probably had the least amount of planning. It's like I have a little window here, nothing else to do. If I don't do it now, I'll never do it. Because that's kind of how you just got to go. I've never even, I mean, I've done a lot of, a lot of trips, both hunting and fishing. And even some of my like worst trips, like hunting trips where I didn't fill a tag or something like that, I don't regret any of them. But they, you know, I I wish, and, and one of the things that I always harp on, man, I know you do too, is like, it's okay to hire a guy. It, it's okay to meet up with people in the area to help out and stuff like that. But like, there, there's something to be said about taking some initiative yourself. Like, Oh yeah. You know, I, you know, some of the stuff I do, like I go out bow hunting in Arizona every year with one of my friends. We just pull tags and go, man. Like we're just going to go and we're going to figure it out. You know, and it's, and, and I, I feel like sometimes even if you don't, get the success that like in your brain, you know, every chip you're thinking, I want that monster fish. I want that, that big yeah. deer. But like, you know, like last time we went, we suffered in the desert for seven days and shot a spike mule deer. And I've, I've killed plenty of big white tails. I think I was more hyped over that mule deer than anything else I've ever shot. Like that was like the hell. Yeah. We came out here, we struggled, we did it. Oh yeah. And you know, I think there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of fishing trips that you just gotta, just gotta go, man. Like you just gotta do it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's like part of it's because I'm just a cheap bastard. Why I don't ever take guides, but <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. you you want to support a, at least like if if I'm gonna go with a guide, I want to find somebody that's like, you know, they're they're working. You know what I mean? Like they're 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 trying to make it. Not you I know, cannot you, stand, you, I cannot stand tourist guides. Yeah, I I I it, it, I'll never say a bad word about them because they're fishermen and they're working. But man, like. The idea of like, oh, we're going to go out, we're going to have a good day, we're going to see some stuff, we're going to catch some fish. If I'm hiring a guide, like, I'm showing up at the boat, I'm ready to work all day. Right. And I'm I'm expecting the same thing. Yeah. And and you want to support those guys that are out there grinding like that uh, to a point. Uh, But obviously, like, I've just, 
you're probably more like me. It's like if I if I fail or when I fail, I want to know that it was like on me. Like I want to own the failure. I don't want yeah. there to be any part of my mind like ah, you know, we di- we didn't get it done because I was using someone else's rig or we didn't get it done because I didn't get to pick where I was at. Like that eats away at my conscience. Like I've Absolutely. had I have lost big fish cuz I was on somebody else's gear and the and the like the rig failed. It could have been me. But I'll I'll never know. You'll never know. Yeah. Because I, Plus, I, I mean, my my fingerprints weren't on every element of what went into catching the fish. So it's like if I fail, I I I can I can eat my failure a lot better than I can eat shared failure. I guess if that sure. makes sense. That's and that's uh that's actually the first fishing trip I've ever taken um, where I hired a boat guy. That's like because I mean I do everything by paddlecraft. There's not. If yeah. I'm if I'm fishing with someone else, it's because it's someone I know in the area who catches fish. You know, like we're just we're just going out as homies. You know, because like, yep. there's not there's not a lot of people out there doing stuff out of canoes and kayaks commercially, anyways. So, no kidding. Uh, well, I I consider the sturgeon thing like it always interests me to see guys, especially ones that travel to go do it. I mean, it's one thing you know you you get your guys that that are just in the culture of sturgeon fishing because that's yeah. in their backyard, but it's like it's one of those fish that like the American angler should like experience it's just like a no-brainer species it's like you know oh, you, yeah. have, you have like these these pillar fish i feel like on the continent and it's like and i say this on a lot of the different episodes where it's like if you're one of those anglers that wants to like you know have some diversity in your experience you want to catch like the most beautiful fish you want to catch the most difficult mm-hmm. fish you want to catch like i don't know the the fastest you want to catch whatever but obviously like one of the first categories that any angler is going to ask is what, okay, what gets the biggest? So it's like, right. it, just, it just makes sense that everybody should have that one on the list to go do. And I feel like it's like a low hanging fruit. I mean, it's like, it's within reach for all, people of a lot of different skill levels. It's to affordable. Go. It's super yeah. affordable too. Like, I, you know, a whole day of fishing in British Columbia costs what it would be for like a half day on the flats here. Like it's pretty, you know, it's so well managed. I don't know if it is the same way in Idaho, but they take it like the, the people who fish for those fish up there. Like, I, you know, you see the videos all the time of people just like mercilessly manhandling tarpon, but they don't treat the yeah. fish up there like that. Like they love the, they love those yeah. fish. They take care of them. And there's a lot of them. I mean, it's a, it's a really good, sustainable fit. Like I'm, I fully support it. Like that's definitely one of the fisheries that I'm like, yeah, I have no problem hiring a guy, putting money in, like, you know, booking the hotels, you know, fueling the economy to go catch some fish because they really take good care of yeah. it. Yeah, I think it's more of a beloved fish. I mean, it makes sense. It's it's good that it's earned that status. It's you know you got other prehistoric giants that haven't had that fortune, like you know the shit that alligator gar have gone through. Oh, that's horrible, dude. Which oh, I think God. is changing. It's like it's made. I feel like they have made that turn, and like they've got a lot of people championing them, and a lot of people like you'll see a lot about like you know you go on the social media and see a you know piles of dead seven foot alligator gar the comment section is full of you know maybe karens and stuff but like people don't like that stuff people do not Uh, like that i've always wanted to ask you how do you feel about the bow fishing for the alligator gar i am not one of the guys that's staunchly anti-bow fishing that's like that's always the battleground with anybody that loves gar and you know some of the other fish that i like are like non-traditional or or trash you know called trash fish i don't mind bow fishing because bow fishing is just an activity. It's like, that's like saying, how do you feel about guns in the wake of like some idiot that abuses firearms? It's like, well, I'm not anti second amendment. I'm not anti the weapon. Bow fishing in and of itself is just like the act of harvesting game with a bow and arrow. It's, it's awesome. I would, I would bow fish in certain circumstances if it was like to harvest food. Cause it's like, it's tribal. It's sort of like, you know, I don't know, man. There's there's some cool elements to it, but like anything else, it's just been unfortunately like compromised and saturated with bad actors. And when they do the wrong thing, it just looks really, really it looks bad. Horrible. It yeah. looks I mean, bad. I so. love the bowfish. I do. I I don't do it so much anymore, but I used to yeah. do a lot of bowfishing. And when I first moved down here, man, I used to go out and shoot a bunch of tilapia and stuff. Just, it is a ton of fun. Yeah. Um, I did just something about the alligator gar where I'm like, man, first of all, it's not difficult to hit a seven foot fish with a bow. I mean, that's about as easy as it gets. Yeah. And secondly, like you're, 
that's just one of those species that I feel like that shouldn't be allowed on. I mean, that's an ancient, ancient animal that's just been persecuted forever and the numbers aren't getting any better. And I don't know. I, I, it's I, crazy to me that's well, still allowed. Well, it's one of those things where it's like a lot of common sense goes into like, okay, here's a fish that takes 10 years to reach sexual maturity. Like they cannot keep up to pressure. It's not like it is not comparable to other species of fish that like, you know, you can go out and shoot a hundred million tilapia tomorrow and make no gem. Nothing yep. will happen. Alligator guard, like they are susceptible to different kinds of pressure. It's like habitat encroachment. Like, and then on top of the fact, like here's a fish that takes a decade to get to the point where it's able to spawn. Then they have such specific like uh, um, environmental like needs to spawn. Like it, it is a species that will not spawn unless the river floods. There has to be a flood or they won't spawn because they have to get into flooded vegetation. And there's periods of drought out there in like areas like Texas where, you know, it may be three years before they, the river gets at a level where they can spill off into the cow pastures and spill off into whatever to spawn. So like on top of... You know, it's, they have these spawn cycles. It's, it's kind of like there's classes of fish. So if you go in there and mow down, a, like what I don't like is when they go into, you know, these flooded fields and they start mowing down the spawning groups. I don't know if you've seen these videos online where. Yeah, I have. When, it's when, horrible. When alligator gar are spawning, you can you can walk up and poke them in the forehead. They, they yeah. just sit there. They are in a trance. They don't care that you're there. You can literally put like you could grab them. So it's like there's no sport to it totally like susceptible to being just annihilated and then you're like you're wiping out massive critical generations of like like genetics that you need so it's like the trophy like the targeting of the trophy size fish gets at me a little bit the practice of shooting spawners gets at me in a little bit but um you know i think the states most of the states are coming around to realizing all right well you know we need to put like a one fish per person per day you know, common sense stuff. But that's a good start. It used to be you go out there. You used to be able to just go shoot a hundred. You used to, be able to fill up the boat. Didn't matter. But I don't understand why they don't treat it more like big game hunting. Like yeah. with other fish, it doesn't matter because you're not harvesting them. But if you're going to bowfish a seven foot alligator gar, why why don't they offer a tag? It doesn't even have to be expensive. Yeah. But if they do it on like a tag basis, then somebody can't just go out and kill thirty of them. But also, then they actually are going to get a real number of what's being harvested right because like now now there's a way to track it yeah that's a uh -huh. tough battle because like when you when you come before a committee they need to see like data like yeah. the person that that has no dog in the fight that's like the you know the, the, the third party that led and lean one way or the next that has two opposing parties they go all right well show me the data show me the show me the numbers and the science and unfortunately mm -hmm. it's not a species of fish that has a lot of historical data like there's just never been big campaigns to collect data on the species of fish. They just have never done it. So it's like you really can't dig deep into the archives to say here is how the populations have been affected by X, Y, and Z. It's just not, and, and, and it's just not enough to stand there and give up an emotion-based argument. Well, it's just wrong. Right. Well, it, just, it hurts. It, you, you can't win. You cannot win. So it's like... But, you know, there are guys out there right now, like there's guys, um, you know, that are that are there's a few that are really campaigning and and, uh, and fighting hard for it that are collecting that data. But it's I don't know. It's a long one, but at least they've already started like they've already started putting in like you can't just go out there and kill them. all. I think in Louisiana, I don't know Louisiana right now, like Texas, you can only shoot like one fish per day that's over like six foot or something to that effect. But in like Louisiana, I think you can still harvest whatever you want to harvest. But yeah, I don't know, man. That's an interesting topic. But we'll never win by just standing on the sidelines and crying and saying, "Ban it, banish bow fishing." You should yeah. ban bow fishing. I and I will always take that stance. Like, man, you can't be crazy. You can't take extreme sides, or no one will hear your argument. You can't. Just, I don't like the idea of banning things because once you open that door. What you, 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 what you love to do might be next because somebody exactly. could say yeah somebody could say hook and line fishing is animal cruelty it causes and inflicts pain it is unethical to do catch and release fishing the mortality rate of some of these fish being released like you know you don't want to open that door uh, do you remember when they did that a couple years ago um for the land-based shark fishing 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that's yeah. that's that's the one that's what well, that's one that's already been banned at certain beaches for different reasons. I don't know even know why. It's, it's you know, uh, I don't know how how many of them are banned in Florida, but like my home state is South Carolina. You can't do it in Hilton Head. You can't do it in Myrtle Beach. You, it is illegal. You can't do it. But it's uh, I learned I learned that one firsthand because I tried to do it in Hilton Head and I got a nice ticket. So yeah, well, Hilton Head. <laughs> I did. I was like, what do you mean I can't? Fish for like that's sad. They, Hilton Head has got some giant sharks. Well, they like, have, yeah. It's there's a reason for it. it. It's just unfortunate that the reasons you can't fish for them have nothing to do with the sharks itself. It's just tourism aspect. Yeah. Right but, well, that's that's been a, a common theme. I, I've tried to touch on the land based shark fishing quite a bit because that's a culture of fishing where it's like, man, your sport is like teetering on the edge. Like if you get one idiot out there making a wrong move, and you got sharks washing up or somebody catching a big shark in broad daylight around a bunch of kids it just like you know you can make a narrative look real bad with one of these you know what i mean oh like, yeah you, oh yeah yeah and that's the, that's the, that's the unfortunate part man like i i see those videos of dudes like reeling in tiger sharks and stuff in the middle of the day like telling surfers to get out the water while they're reeling it in i'm like oh my gosh man like yeah i i, I love good look. I love land-based shark fishing i've dabbled in it a little bit but i wouldn't even consider myself one of those guys I no. kind of like on the sidelines and I, I dip my toes in that world a little bit every now and then. But I, I even I know better than to do that. You just can't yeah. you, you can't be stupid with it. But um, I get these waves because I'm 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 at the, at the core. I'm just lazy. But shark land based shark fishing is so much work. It's so much work. And I yeah. get, uh, like I don't I won't do it for a really long time. And then I like I'll just get this idea in my head of like, man, I haven't caught a big shark in forever. And then you go out and you catch nothing. And then it lights that fire, and you're like, "All right, well now I'm going every free day I get until I get one." And then I catch one, and then you know, six months go by, and then I'm like, "Ah, I want to do this again." Yeah. Or like, yeah. <laughs> it's it's always funny to me too. I don't know if you get this, but when family and friends come in from like out of town, especially like people who not hardcore fish, or my friends who like they're outdoors, they want to fish. No one ever comes to me and is like, "I want to catch triple tail," or like, yeah, "I want to yeah. catch like both." They're like, "No, nah, they want to catch shark." And I'm like. All right, well, sure. <laughs> yeah, it makes you happy. We'll catch a shark. <laughs> yeah, I have I, I had my I've had my dad, and my brothers come. That's yeah, but it's also an easy one. It's like you know, if you want to entertain an out of state person with a big fish, that's you know, it's like a taboo thing. Oh, it's a shark. It they're, they're, they're man yeah. eaters. It's like you know, you get somebody from the interior states. You know, it's interesting to get in the water and and see a shark. But I I kind of oh, get, get it. it. I'm the same way though. It's like I'll catch one or two a year, and I'm like, well, I mean, what's? They're all basically the same thing. I'm like, I need variety, but, but yeah, I just don't do it. Also, because I'm like, I go alone. I'm like, heaven forbid, something that's too big for me to handle. Like, you know, it's, you like, you need to move quickly, and it's like hard to do it when you're by yourself. But yeah. I have the best, and no, probably not the best, probably the best story you've ever heard of fish shark fishing alone. <laughs> So I, uh, I went out one night, this is like three years ago, probably. And I was like, all right, I want to shark fish. Nobody could go with me. It was like a weekday. So I just took one rod and uh, you know, how you go to the beach, set up your chairs, set up your cooler, put the rod in, you got to paddle it out. Well, what I always do is have someone stand on the beach with a headlamp. So I know like, I look back and make sure I'm going straight, but this particular beach, I didn't need it because I was a alone and B there were hotels behind it. Yeah. So I didn't even I didn't even have a headlamp on her. I didn't even have a light with me. I was just paddling out there in the dark. And I'm like 300 and some yards off the beach. And uh all of a sudden it's like really freaking hard to paddle. And I'm like <laughs> trying to paddle out. I'm like, what the hell? What the hell? What the hell? I'm like, I'm getting frustrated. And I'm thinking like there's a current. So I'm trying to like splash the water and watch the water to see if like it's moving faster. And it, I couldn't figure it out. So I just dropped the bait. And started paddling back in and realized I'd been pulled in like 70 yards. Some guy was walking down the beach and thought my rod was unattended. <laughs> oh my saw, God. He saw the line going out and he <laughs> thinks he's fighting like, like a freaking great white or something. And I come paddle back in. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he's yeah. like, Oh my God. Like there's a fish on here. I'm like, no, it was me. Like, I'm like, that's my shit. I'm paddling this out. And we like, he it took him a while to realize what was going on. And we kind of yeah. laughed about it. <laughs> I was so confused because he didn't have a flashlight Four. either. So, yeah, yeah, somebody abandoned this thousand dollar rod and reel setup out here. 
Yeah, oh, but it, it made me think about it, though, because I'm like, damn, if I was doing that alone and someone just came and cut my line, like, I, they would just take my stuff and I would never know. It's always like, in the back of my mind when I do like a solo paddle out. It's like my fear is always that I'm paddling my rod and reel out to sea. Yeah. And man, what if my rod like got pulled over somehow? I, the only times I've had similar things happen, like I paddle out and then like, you know, my my. uh you know, my FG knot or something gets stuck in the guide and it's like, I'm like paddling, trying to get it to come through. But, you know, I I had, I did have a boat come through and cut in behind me one time when I was paddling out. That was a disaster. And, uh, Oh, that's like the worst case scenario. Yeah. That's bad. Well, I threw the rig cause I knew it was coming. I'm like, Oh shit. You know, cause I threw the rig over hoping it would get down, but it did not make it down. And, uh, so when I was paddling back in, I was paddling, I could hear, I can hear the drag screaming. <laughs> oh no! I was like, "Oh, that's gonna ruin my reel." He's going like forty oh. miles an hour, and oh, that's um, terrible. Yeah, that was at Big Carlos Pass. So he headed under the bridge, which was nice because as soon as it hit the, you know, he, the pilot he, snap, he took all my two hundred pound top shot to the prop. <laughs> but as soon as he, as soon as he got to the braid, it was like pfft, gone. So I was so scared that I was gonna see my rod get yoinked into the, yoinked into the water never to be seen again but yeah now i heard uh, i i know a guy who paddled out of bait and he fell asleep and he forgot to turn his clicker on and he woke up to uh no rod and reel oh jeez yeah yeah i'm you sure can see, no, you can see the drag mark through the sand where it got drug in so. i'm sure there's no shortage of those stories but you know now we're starting to we're starting to teeter into the more the florida stuff so we'll segue <laughs> into yeah, your yeah. experience in florida uh, where are you from originally? You told me before, but I can't remember. Like, how did you end up in Florida? All I know is yeah, that you're not I'm, from Florida. No, I'm from Ohio. Ohio, so okay. I, I was born and you know, raised in Ohio. I lived there until I was in my 20s. And uh, I really, I mean, people don't think of Ohio as a fishing or outdoor state, but it's phenomenal, man. I mean, we have, like, such good whitetail hunting, good duck hunting. Uh, the musky fishing is, like, second to none. Your oh, sure. short drive to like Lake, Lake Sinclair. I mean, there's like the musky fish. I was a huge musky fisherman. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Steelhead fishing, all, you know, big, small, like some of the biggest smallmouth bass in the world. Like there's such good fishing in Ohio. And I was really blessed that um, I did that my whole life. Like it, it was just like, you know, I straight out the womb, I'm into a deer stand. Like that's just how it was for me. So yeah, I, I didn't know anything different. Um, but gosh, I had to have been like nine years ago now, eight years ago. Um, you, you're, you know, um, Kevin Hughes. Yeah. So I grew up with, or with Pat, you know, I've known him for, you know, almost five, 14, 15 years now. I don't know. Um, but we grew up fishing together and he's like the fishiest human I've ever met in my life. <laughs> yeah. And he moved to Miami and I used to come down and visit and fish with him. And it took like one, the first trip I came down here, I was like, Oh man, this is the, this is the promised land. I got to yeah. get down. Here. <laughs> and, um, I am one of those guys, man. I talked about it forever and, you know, like, oh, it's, it'll be next year will be the year. Like we'll get it done. And, you know, my wife, when she was my girlfriend at the time, you know, just got sick and tired of hearing me talk about it. And she just applied for a job down here and got an interview and got hired at a pretty high level. And she was like, all right, well, we're moving. And that was it. We just packed our bags and moved here. And nice. um, I was a firefighter and uh, Florida doesn't accept fire cars from other states so you're forced to go back to the academy which is like 18 months mm. and then it's a very competitive state to get a job in because they have something here called sunshine tax which means everybody wants to move here so the job you know job market can be kind of difficult to get into and this is pre-covid obviously so even then it was difficult <laughs> yeah um, so i decided to go back to school to be a nurse so i went through that whole route and my first uh two years living in florida i was a full-time student um, five days a week. And I had, I was working like 30 hours a week and I just, still just, I mean, I just didn't sleep. I just fished, you know, around the, any, any, if I had an hour between class, I was fishing. If I had a night off where I didn't have to work, I was just, I just fished, 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 fished. And for me, that was like every day was something new and exciting. Like every, every day was something like I've always dreamt about doing. And I had like this, just this drive to just go out there every day. Like I never had before. Everything was brand new. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it was pretty awesome. And I, I noticed too, that, um, I have friends who move from Florida to other States and, uh, they go to a different state you know, and they, they do the same thing. I think it's just like when you move, I'm sure you experienced it too. When you moved here, you're like, man, like it's a whole new world. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I'm the same way too because I don't even have family or anybody down here. We just I had nothing. Yeah, yeah my wife and I got a <laughs> yeah we we got a hunch. And it's funny, like you know, you come from these. I was in Arkansas, sort of the same thing. It's like, oh, what the hell's in Arkansas? But you know, I was like right there, like right on the edge, really in the middle of the Ozark. So it was the same thing. It was, it was good fishing, but I don't know. I'm just not really a trout and smallmouth bass guy, especially yeah. small ones. Um, yeah. And I got the same thing when I lived in Oklahoma. I lived in Oklahoma. People like, oh, Oklahoma, that would suck. Oklahoma's got phenomenal fishing, great yeah. fishing. Um, but. Yeah, I got to a point where I was just like, you know what? We just need to be impulsive. Got young kids. Disney's out there. Beaches, warm weather, amazing fishing. It's a east back back, you know, on the east coast, closer to the east coast where we're originally from. And uh, so I just started carpet bombing the job market in Texas and in Florida. My wife was happy because Florida called first, but uh, <laughs> it's either yeah, Texas or Florida. It, oh yeah, she loves it. We we would yeah. never move from here. And I, I have moved them enough in the last 10 years. I don't want to put them through any more moves. But, you know, we like it. we like it down here. Even with these storms, we like it down here. So, yeah, yeah for, dude, everyone, for everyone listening, I don't, we never even told them, like, there's there's an actual hurricane happening. Like, yeah. While we're, <laughs> no. while we're talking. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's like right off the coast right now. Yeah. Right? yeah. We're, we're, we're so, not stopping. We're still on schedule. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, um, well, thank God we have internet service. But yeah, dude, I remember when I found your. I don't actually. I don't remember when I found your page. I don't remember how I found your page. You know, I lo I just you know you find people on Instagram and you can kind of. I don't know. I feel like I can ascertain who's a you know a clown show and who's you know right. somebody that's out there getting after it. And and then I sort of realized that you were new to Florida, but I'm seeing like land based goliaths, huge sharks, all these tarp, and I'm like. What the hell? Like in all the exo all of the exotics, and then some, and then like some really, really like obscure, rare ones. So yeah. I'm like, what was the process for? Like, was it how much of it was luck? How much of it was like the game planning going into it? Because you seem like you just like I don't know if you were like you were like just chopped down all these different species like one after the other. Was that like was that the intention? Like, all right, now I want to catch this fish. Caught it. Done. Now I want to get this one. Got it done. Here's the yeah. next one on the list. Honestly, and I have to, and like, I'm always one of those people. I will give credit where credit's due. When I moved down here, Kevin really hooked me up. But Kevin is a madman about one thing and one thing only, and that's flats fishing. Yeah. So <laughs> we fish the flats all the time for tarpon, and we fish for bonefish, and we fish for permit, which, you know, anyone who lives in Florida or is a serious angler. That's always our top three. So I got very blessed that like my second day living in Florida, I caught like a five pound bonefish from a kayak. Yeah. And at, at, at the time, like there weren't very many people who were catching bonefish from a kayak. Like I have a huge bonefish that I literally like Kevin was like, we're going here. We're catching bonefish, but he lived here long enough that the whole idea of chasing exotics and goliaths and sharks and stuff like that, just like, that just, it, it wasn't his interest anymore, which is totally fine. And, uh, you know, I, He's on a level that I just, I, I was at times. So I was pretty much on my own. So yeah. I realistically just kind of just fudged my way through it, man. I just was like, all right, I'm going to, I spent so much time driving around, looking at new areas, trying new things. Like I just, I went through the whole peacock bass phase, which was like the beginning of it. Cause that's like the easiest. And then I went on to the Paku and the clown knot. I just, everything, man. And just yeah. was really, <laughs> I, I don't, I didn't know anyone. Um, to be honest with you, I still, to this day, I only fish with like two people. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, it's not that I don't like people and I, I don't keep a small circle because I'm like a, a tinfoil hat. You know, I, I just don't know that many people. I'm an outgoing person, but I don't know, man. Like I just, I just have never really fished yeah. with a large group of people. So everything I've done outside of that, I've pretty much done myself. Um, until I started fishing heavily with Elliot for tarpon and we realized that we both were like, we're doing it by paddle craft or it's not, you know, there's, there's no option. Like we're not getting a boat. We're doing it from a canoe. And then that's <laughs> when we really dove heavily into that. But all the snook, the big snook, the big tarp and all that stuff, it was just, was me just literally driving around and finding a spot and being like, you know, fishing every waking hour. I mean, there was times where I was getting up at one o'clock in the morning, fishing till 6am going home, showering, going to class, yeah. coming home, <laughs> eating, going to work and then sleeping a couple hours. And then maybe go out. I mean, just, 
I, I look back on it and I'm like, I mean, as much as I love fishing, if I would have had that kind of drive about anything else in my life, I probably wouldn't <laughs> yeah, have to work. <laughs> oh <laughs> like, God, I know. <laughs> I think about that sometimes too. I, I spent a good like three years plus of just like, I mean, every waking hour that I had, I was on Google Earth, like Google Maps, like Google mapping every like feature in every area of like Southwest, but really just the bottom, everything from like L- Lake Okeechobee down. Yeah. And like, you know, I would like, I'd, I'd make a pin, I'd send the pin to my like own email. And then like on the weekend, I'd go drive out there and check it out. But that's fun. And that's like yeah. relatable. And that's what I like about like your style is like, you know, is, you know, it's, You've done a lot with less. And I think that's, I always like guys that do that with less gear. You mentioned the paddle craft thing and with less of a a circle of friends, I'm the same way. The guys that I fish with the most don't even live in Florida. There's a total loner. Maybe I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's like you can benefit a lot off of, you know, what other people are doing, but you can also benefit a lot off of figuring things out on on your own. I'm not getting. I will say. I fish with, like I said, two other guys. One of them's Elliot, who I, I mean, we just, it's just what we do. We fish together all the time. Yeah. He's, my, he's my partner in the Python program and we do everything. But the other one, his name's Anton. I maybe fish with Anton like three times, four times a tarpon season, right? But he's, he's an invaluable friend because we'll, you know, we're on that level where we'll, we'll share information with each other where it's like, hey man, yeah. like I was here last night and they were like eating heavy. And then, you know, and it, that's, that's been helpful. But I did not have that the first two and a half years I lived down here, man. I yeah. mean, being a new guy, I didn't know anybody. Anybody I did meet, like, I didn't really meet anybody organically outside of you and a couple people. Like, it was like through Instagram, and you know how it is. If you catch a nice fish, people end up in your DMs yeah. asking about it. So that's kind of like, you know, and I, I, I know how it came off. But I really just was trying to make friends. Like, hey, like, I, I know that same spot. I've caught fish there. Like, I'd love to go out. Like, let's go fish. And then, you know, but no one's really interested. In, and and being that way, and I just kind of gave up on it. And I was like, all right, well, yeah. you know, I'm. I'm gonna do my own thing, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, it's it's hard to, it's harder and harder to, especially fishermen, where everybody's you know by nature very secretive of what they know, what they have. It's like it almost has to be like transactional. I've probably yeah. been more charitable than I should have been with certain fishing spots, but it's uh, you know, I think, you know, it, it's nice when it's and it's also hard to approach somebody and ask for like. You know, and, and ask for guidance on things. It's like you—you you better come equipped with something to like offer in return. I—I yeah, I think. And I get—I um, get a lot of questions still to this day. And like, my Instagram's private. I don't have a big social media following. I try. I mean, it's just really not my thing. But I yeah. still get lots of questions. And the first thing I always start with is like, "Well, what have you tried?" And the amount of mm-hmm. people who are like, "Well, nothing. I'm just trying to get like get a spot." I'm like, "All right. Well, then we're done talking." <laughs> yeah. Because if you come to me and you're like, I've gone here, I've gone here, I've gone here, I've tried this and this and this, I can tell you put effort in. Maybe I'm going to throw you a little bone and be like, yeah, you know, one of those spots you went to is actually pretty good, but you're doing it the wrong way. Try this way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I wish, I just wish more people, we got away from this culture of like, I'll put, you know, I'll put you on if you put me on or I, you know, hook me up or more or less like I tried it myself, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you should only uh-huh. be really ballparking things for folks anyway. It's like, I mean, there's there yeah. needs to be a learning process or it's a completely like fruitless um, you know, fish if if caught. It's like a well again yeah, like, it goes, like, yeah, it goes it almost goes back to almost goes back to the ownership thing. If so if yeah. somebody tells me exactly where to go and exactly what to use, exactly what time, that it's their catch. It's it, that's what I'm saying. Like uh, at, at some point, like I wouldn't know anything. If people just put me on fish, yeah. I would I would know how to catch fish the exact place in the exact way they taught me. And you know how it is down here. Tides are everything. So, okay, yesterday yeah. we caught them just like this at 7 a.m. I come back tomorrow, it ain't that way. Like, you need to be doing it yourself and learn. Like, learning what doesn't work is just as valuable as learning, you know. Like, when we when I started really getting into the big tarpon, right, like, you know, big, big tarpon, I went through a curve where we hooked probably 60-plus fish. Um, and when I say hooked, like when I talk about tarpon and I say, Oh, we we lost, we fought and lost this many fish. I don't count the first like 10 seconds. Like, yeah. if, if that fish is on past 10 seconds and I'll, and it comes off, that's a lost fish. Cause it like anything can happen those first 10 seconds. It goes absolutely crazy. It is what it is. I'm counting, but we pulled hooks. We bent hooks. We broke leader. We missed I just, there's so much stuff that like I would have 
never learned how to not learn it the hard way. You know, I don't know. It's just, yeah. Well, you know, there's, you, there's, there's, there's things I learned I can get away with sometimes yeah. and it doesn't work. On the topic of the tarpon and the bigger yeah. fish, you know, what you do that I what you do that I love, probably because I do like it's it's just what I enjoy. You keep mentioning like small paddle craft. And a lot of people are probably assuming, okay, well, you know, you fancy uh, you know, Hobie kayak that's rigged with all this stuff. Like what I like that you're doing, uh, uh you and Elliot is is catching these damn things out of canoes. Like yeah, dude. Like that is like, it, to to me, that's what I love. Like that is raw. That is like we got two. We got two rides. And one of them is thanks to you. One of them is like a 1984 Grumman. The Grumman that's together with duct tape doesn't have <laughs> seats. We use like five dollar igloo coolers as seats. Yeah, uh, we just paddle. And then um, I did that. I had the sports paddle this year that I, I put together, and that is my favorite rig I've ever owned. Yeah. That thing is the sweetest ride of all time. But yeah, man, like I, you know, I always laugh. Like you see the big. Hobie Pro Anglers and all that stuff with enough electronics on it. You just buy a damn boat, bro. Just buy a boat. Oh, yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> like, well, especially it, the it, cost it, of them is like you could at least get like a micro skiff or you could at least get like something that, that I don't know. But um, yeah. the canoe fishing, like for me, it's also like there's obviously some hazards involved and it's not, they don't, they don't, you know, it's, there's a lot more work involved too, which I can appreciate. But I've had one experience hooking a big tarp into my canoe. And it beat my ass like no other fish has ever done. I, I felt so helpless and I felt like such a bitch. So I'm like, okay, I'd be like remiss if I didn't ask like for some tips and like, like yeah. how, how, like the tactics behind it, because it's dangerous. Like when it you're, is. It is. What, what and are, it, um, we'll, give me just, first of all, get, we'll yeah. fix that this year. Cause there's a spot about uh, a very short drive from both our houses where we'll, we'll get you a big one from the canoe. That'll, that'll happen in a couple months, but it's, it's dangerous. Um, We've probably hooked 200 plus tarpon and fought them from from the canoe at this point. Uh, we've had them land in the canoe. We've been knocked out of the canoe. Oh. We've flipped the canoe. <laughs> um, we've had shark problems in the canoe, which if you think you're a man, you will shit your pants. Mm. Um, not fun. Not There's zero bit about that that's fun. Yeah. Um, and uh, luckily, that's only happened twice. And both both times, though, was not. Not fun, but it's it's a it's a big learning curve. But for me, I like I like doing the paddle craft stuff. There's just something about it. Um, makes me we always laugh and we're all like, you know, we catch a big tarpon and we're like, the ancestors are smiling tonight. Like those yeah. those Indians <laughs> in the canoe, man. They're like, yeah, yeah. I you know, I always thought, like someday I want to go to like uh, like Borneo or the Amazon and like get in the canoe with the guys and then be like impressed, like, oh yeah, these guys are, like. They're legit. Like that's yeah. that's the the validation I I want. I don't care about the dude who owns a TV show or something. Like I want the I want the dude yeah. fishing out of a dugout <laughs> canoe to be like, yeah, he's legit. I don't know. I just it's a challenge. Like anybody anybody can go out with a guide and hook tarpon from a boat, but like let's see you do it two o'clock in the morning from a canoe and current. Like it's it's hard. It's hard. Um, okay. But the biggest thing with them is that I like. I think in our area they get pressured a lot, um, so they. Like they, they know the, like they have lines down their bodies and in every single scale that can sense the pressure in the water, mm -hmm. right? They're sensing that trolling motor. They're sensing you idle your motor. They're sensing that 22 foot boat coming over top of them. Like they know you're there. Granted, there's definitely times where they don't care and they're feeding. And if you got the right bait, they're going to eat. But another thing I'd be remiss if I don't talk about is, um, of all the tarpon I have caught in my life, I have caught one on live bait. Oh, uh, all artificial. Everything nice. I do is artificial. Um, and it's nothing special. It's just honestly the the amount that Ellie and I both work. The thought of having to paddle around in a canoe and catch bait is just yeah. I'm not doing it. It's just miserable. Like I'm not doing it. So <laughs> artificial it is. It's um, harder to keep them alive too. I because I've done some of the live is. bait stuff out of canoes for other types of fish. It's just like it adds weight, which adds drag. And then it's just like you don't have a nice fancy. You might be able to put some kind of aeration system in there. It's like whatever you put in the canoe is not going to live for very long. It's not. It's not. No. Yeah, it's not what it's there well, for. One, one thing I learned because we did um, at one point we were trying, like uh, I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with the glass minnow run, but uh, I've yet yes. to I've yet to figure out a good way to target tarpon during the glass minnow run because um, they just kind of shut off everything with glass minnows, unless you're a fly fisherman. That's probably your best bet, um, but you just 
someday I want to get good at it. But now we're talking a canoe in current with two guys in it fighting big fish from a fly rod. You're starting to really push what's like, yeah. <laughs> fun. Like, it uh, yeah. doesn't sound very fun to me. So, yeah. um, but, you know, when we used, tried it with big baits, like I have a, an actual cooler in there with mullet. And in, in a canoe, when you start rocking, the water in that live well rocks. And then it starts rocking at a different, like, frequency than the boat and oh yeah it really like can throw you off especially if you're standing it's not good so i just the whole thing about it i don't know yeah that's it's a good point work. i didn't even think about yeah. that yeah 100 percent. i've only had one experience with the glass minnow run well i've seen it once the first year i moved here in naples in this little bay area and it was like yeah. blew my mind and then i did seen it once there was a big glass minnow run on the east coast and that was the same thing. There were tarpon every. I was. That's when I had a boat before I sold it, and uh, there were so many tarpon eating these minnows. There, I mean, I, I could at one point I got out of the boat and walked on the sand. These tarpon were like putting their face on the beach yeah. and eating them. I like I could have I could have flipped lure into their mouth, uh, but they wouldn't eat anything I threw. I'm like I don't know how you'd even mimic a fish like that. You can, a like, spoon, tried, like I'm maybe a spoon. Everything. Yeah, I've tried the spoons. I've tried the little DOAs. I've tried those hard baits that look like a school of bait fish put together. Yeah. Um, they're just so keyed in on the glass. But I'm, I'm sure someone's listening to this laughing right now because yeah, they found some I have way no to shame. I'm not a tarpon fisherman. I'm trying yeah. to learn here, people. Yeah. I, I, somebody, somebody's listening to this who just probably crushes them during the glass. It's probably their favorite time of the year to catch them. They're just laughing. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I haven't. That, again, that's the thing. Like, I like figuring stuff out myself the yeah. hard way. And I'm not. I'm not anti-boat, so I don't ever think I'm anti-boat. I'm actually yeah, in the market yeah. for a boat, um, but I do I do really enjoy uh, just the challenge of it. Um, but yeah, so from the canoe, at least, like I was saying, they sense that boat, the trolling motor and stuff. I can sneak up on fish in that mm -hmm. canoe, and they don't know I'm there. And a lot of times, those big fish, you're going to get, I'd say, two shots. If you, if you know they're there a specific fish you're gonna get two shots on it after that if it didn't eat it's not gonna eat it's gonna know you're there um but a lot of times you know it's just a matter of just trying to time that current right and be there when the fish want to be there feeding fighting them from the canoe is horrible it's fun it's a blast yeah. but it's like you know <laughs> you, you become a giant bobber which is a problem because yeah. um you're not wearing the fish out so a lot of times what i'm doing is uh we're hooking them Fighting them, you know, they're going to jump like crazy. And then they kind of just get into that mode where they're pulling you around. And I'm trying to get somewhere shallow enough that I can get out. And that's where things get kind of sketchy, especially, you know, in shark infested waters where they're, they're feeding on tarpon. Yeah. And now you're <laughs> splashed around trying to land them. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see too many people doing it, man. I really don't. I mean, you see the guys on the East Coast catching them during the mullet run from the kayaks and stuff, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know too many too many people who are catching them from canoes at least in the numbers that we are i don't know but yeah i'll be i've been out i've been out there man in the in the tarpon armada of all the boats in the canoe and they're just looking at me like i'm crazy you know the photos are gnarly because that's that's what and you've already actually you, i mean you pretty much naturally answered a lot because i'm like you know i think the advantages that the canoe has is sort of anybody could have guessed that it uh, offers better stealth uh, yeah. and better opportunity to sneak sneak up on the fish, but then you know the hazards are also pretty self explanatory with with the fighting. But uh, you know, I see the photos of y'all gripping their jaw at the side of the canoe. I'm gonna say, man, that is so intimidating. Like the idea of oh, yeah. tipping and falling, yep. and then every no. bit of every bit of water they throw on you is gonna stay in the canoe. Yep. Um. Uh, so so when, when we go out, um, I'm it's super minimalist. One rod. Yeah. That's it. We take one rod. I have a dry bag of tackle that we roll tight so it floats. Uh, headlamps and life jackets, man. And that's what we're rolling with because anything like we've done enough to know that anything can happen. I I don't like bringing extra rods and stuff because if they flip, then they're gone. Yeah, you know. And I don't are you, like. Are you I, paddling? I yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're paddling. So See, that's the part that's tough because like the canoes get pushed. If there's any little bit of wind, any little bit of current, they get pushed. So as I was yeah. curious, like I guess if it's the two of you, I, if you're out there with a partner, at least one person can kind of, I don't know. Yeah, and I steady, do. It, but... um, I I do do it alone still. Um, I oh, just yeah. do it from my Hobie Outback, which I, in my opinion, the eight 2017 to 2019 Hobie Outback is the greatest kayak ever made. It's 
But the thing is, people buy them and then they get too much on. I have nothing on mine. It's literally just the kayak. I have a little dry hole where I put my phone and some storage and the pedals. And it's nice enough that like it's light, it's movable, it's stable enough I can stand out of. Um, and I've caught a, plenty of really big tarpon alone from my kayak. It's just, you know, when you're alone, it's very difficult to wear them out. It's a, it's a long process. And they're very green. And when you try to grab them, then you got to have... I, I see people if you're if you're catching big tarpon, it's not no thumbs in the mouth, man. It's all fingers, thumbs on the outside because they're. Yeah. And I, I always talk about like landing and taking photos. Everybody's always concerned about the health of the fish, and they are they're definitely one that you don't want to take out of the water. But if you look at my tarpon photos, they're they're all crap. I'm actually really jealous of the photos you get of your fish because they look so much better than mine. Um, <laughs> but I could show you the videos, man. Where like. I'm getting the shit beat out of me grabbing those fish. Like there's yeah. cause, cause you, you know, from a boat, you can whoop them from the canoe. You're more or less tricking them. You're tricking them into coming into shallower water and then grabbing them when they're not expecting it. And it's a full on wrestling match. Like I've watched Elliot get drugged on un- completely underwater with like, yeah. and me having to like <laughs> reel him and the fish back in. Like it's not, I'm not even kidding. They, they are very green and, uh, that we don't get very good pictures. Cause you maybe get like two or three seconds of it, not moving. Yeah. And then, you know, Oh, good but, quality pictures are nice and it's a luxury, but it's not like, you know, you can't make that, especially fish like that. I mean, I, you know, if, if some of my best photos are of something like an alligator gar, that's different. Like they are, are, you know, it's a fish that can stay out of water for like 30 minutes if it stays wet and they're just yeah. not, that they're not, it's not even on the same, but I, I, I've never caught a big tarpon, so I wouldn't even know how to handle that. But, um, well, you know. I, I noticed too, the, the different times of year, um, it really makes a difference. Like we went out actually last night and got a decent one. Um, but the water right now, dude, is like 90 degrees. Yeah. Uh, not, not good for reviving fish. And that's the canoe that I built this year. Um, the sports pal, I've got a three horse on the back of it, which I absolutely mm-hmm. love because, um, I don't use it while fishing. So the way we fish hasn't changed, but it's allowed me to, uh, like if I go to a spot, I want to fish and it's not that great. I can go somewhere else. Yeah. But the I would buy an outboard for a canoe 100 percent of the time simply for reviving fish. It has made nice. my life so much easier because instead You're of having to walk them through the water, yep, yeah, yep, literally like instead of having to walk them around and stuff, uh, I get on the engine and Elliot lays in the bottom of the canoe with his just literally like on his belly with just his arm and the fish over yeah. the side. <laughs> we just we just drag it till it kicks hard enough that he can't hold on, and then it swims away. You know, like it revives them so much better in this hot water. It's, you know, in the, in the wintertime, I've noticed they, they, they don't have that many problems. They, they're pretty yeah. green and ready to go. But in the summer, yeah, they, they, you got to really revive them. Well, uh, Elliot, we keep mentioning him. So shout out to that guy. That seems like the ideal yeah. partner for a wild man. Cause he's got, <laughs> the dude looks like Tarzan. He's like a little power lifter. Wild he, he man. Look, he looks like he's a homeless guy who like showers once a month, but I, I promise you, he's a, he's a functioning, he's a, he's a substitute teacher and, all kinds of stuff. He's he's a functioning adult. He just doesn't look like it. <laughs> he's another one whose who's social media I love to look at. The dude's an animal. He's like a, he is. squatting like five hundred pounds and then wrestling a giant pythons and stuff. But yeah, yeah that's and a that's, good partner. He, he had never done any reptile stuff till um, we started really hanging out. Okay. Um, so we started doing like the chameleons, and I you know I started really getting heavily into the pythons, especially when I like got into, you know the program doing that, which you know we can talk about later. But um, yeah, we really dove into tarpon together because he's from here and i think it was one of those things where like you don't talk about the tarpon run unless it's with someone else who knows about the tarpon yeah and i i found it on my own and did all my own like i just from simply just like not sleeping and grinding so we kind of met through that and then you know we're like all right well like we fished a couple times together and and we were talking about how like you know we can find them and I'm and, and I'm hooking them, but I can't land them. And he's having similar problems. So we started just fishing a lot together, trying new things. And we really like, you know, like you got, I, we got a system down. We're like, we don't even have to talk, man. It's like, it's just a robot. It's at this point, we just everybody. Yeah. We, we both know who, who's on the rod, what the other one's got to do, the whole nine yards, and have really made it to like a well-oiled machine. But it took a long time to get there, though. So we lost, we lost a lot of fish. There's a lot of times yeah. where like we, we. <laughs> Just when, you know, I just was like, I'm done trying this because it's just, it's heartbreak. You fit, fight a fish for 45 minutes to an hour and then it just gets pops off, off for, for some reason you don't even understand. And that's part of tarpon yeah. fishing, but 
you know, we're, we've got to the point now where um, this run was, this year was a bad run for us. I don't know. I, some of the people seem to have a lot of success, but we, I kind of took it for granted. They were here really, really thick at first. And I was like, we caught a lot of fish right up front. And I was like, all right, we got, we got months of this. And they just disappeared. Yeah. And then it was like, you know, trickles of fish, which meant, you know, you had to really make your shots count. Like you had to be smart and you weren't going to get second chances. And I think, I think that this year we're up to like, we landed like, I don't know, right on 2021. 20, I bet we only hooked like 60 fish. So that's, I mean, tarpon wise, I, I feel like that's a good landing ratio. I don't yeah. know what other people do, but you know, my first, my first year we went like 30 or 40 fish before we landed one. So yeah. yeah. Jeez. I don't know. That's wild. Well, it probably doesn't help too much being in a canoe and you just sort of, out, you're at the mercy of the initial burst of power they have. But the, oh, other one, the other one that you do though, that like is even almost seems crazier is like, and maybe, maybe easier. I don't know. Is the Goliath grouper out of a canoe? No, now, it's way, no, it's not. No, no, I, I, I'm be honest with you. I, unless, unless you are someone, you could do it. Someone who's really experienced in a canoe or a kayak. Yeah. That's not one to try. That's right because if they want to pull you into something i don't know how you can fight that that's in a the canoe difference. that's yeah. the difference because uh with the tarpon they're dangerous in the aspect that they're uh 150 to 200 pound fish that's going to jump and if you're in the way of where it's jumping you're going to get hit and you're going to get flipped and landing them's hard the goliath grouper on the other hand are going for the heaviest structure they can find and you're going with them right uh and it is dangerous. Like it's dangerous, especially if you're fishing like a dock or structure or something in heavy current. They're going in, and if you're not prepared for that, you're going with them. And yeah. <laughs> like it, that's that's. Um, I don't I don't target them so much anymore. I I still catch them because um, they're they're greedy little bastards. But we got one last year, man. That was like almost 300 pounds from the canoe, and it was it, it was an all night ordeal. Like it took us hours to to wear this thing down and i mean i think it's pretty cool i don't know how many people can say they've caught you know a 250 plus pound glass from a canoe but it's dangerous it's real dangerous yeah you you you, you're no stranger that you've caught plenty of them but never from a canoe but i just i can't imagine because like at least the tarpon's like pulling you i i'm assuming here uh, like across the water yeah the goliath is like pulling your ass down and against things like like, up against something so So imagine this you got a 150 pound fish that you fought them has like their zero to like their torque is insane. Like they might not have the most insane top speed, but that torque, there's yeah. nothing stopping them. You hook one in a canoe. It wants to go somewhere. You're going with it. You have to simultaneously put enough drag on it to stop it. It's going to break you off. But also you have to keep that rod in line with the canoe because if that rod is off to the side, it's going to flip you. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to, yeah. so, and, and then you have to still try to navigate the canoe and pull them. It's just, there's like a, all the stars have to align to make it work. Yeah. <laughs> but the difference with Goliath grouper are if you get them out the structure and you get them to open water, as long as your hook's good and your lead is good, you can just, it's a caught fish. Like you're going to get, mm-hmm. like, if you're smart, you're going to get that fish. Cause then they just do the thing where they, they open their mouth when you try to reel them up to just yeah. make themselves like a bull, like a, a, like a, like a umbrella coming through the water, like a yes. wind sail. It, you know, you just got to be patient with it. Um, you'll be all right. But yeah, that, that initial, we, I, I was saying, if you make it past 60 seconds with a Goliath, your, your odds of landing it are pretty good. But yeah. that first 60 seconds, you could end up losing everything you own and having to swim to, sh- to, swim to shore. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that stuff's awesome. I love the canoe fishing. I'm like, I got to ask him about some of the canoe adventures. This is like, that's so awesome. But, um, you know, we we're can always talk- so jealous of yours, man. Cause like we had this, that beat up thing held together with duct tape and JB. Well, and we were like, I kept seeing your canoe. And I'm like, man, like we gotta, we just step our game up. That thing's a freaking Cadillac. Just, just, just get a good bilge sponge. And like the day will never end. And one good I, yeah, you sponge what, and you're good. Um, <laughs> I love what do they call uh the are they called sponsons? Yeah. On the outside. Man, those have been a game changer. Um yeah. it's been way safer for me, that's for yeah. sure. Um that that I we've actually been talking about uh just ordering another set and just kind of retrofitting them to the old the And old, they uh, look nice. They kind of like look cool, not that that matters. But it's cool. like they, they make the canoe look sharp, but yeah, it's just a no-brainer thing to have on there just to say. I didn't I didn't safe. think they'd make that much of a difference, but like yeah. immediately I noticed. I was like, "Oh wow, like this thing is it, it when it, when those 
foam pads hit the water, there's clear, there's a clear resistance to flipping. So, yeah, yeah, you could just about sit on the side of them, hang your feet over the uh, over the edge at, at times, but but um, that's cool. But um, I'm trying to find the best way to get into this. Like <laughs> the the elephant in the room for me uh, is is this this reptile stuff that you're involved in. <laughs> I'm still I'm oh, looking at the yeah. aquariums, and I'm just like, we're just cannonballing into it. We're just like, <laughs> just diving into it out, out of the I could we could talk for another hour about all the other fishing. I'm just going to gloss even I'm just going to I'm just going to skip some of the exotics. Um you know just for personal interest. I hate to be so selfish but like the t- yeah. the, can, the canoe fishing for tarpon and goliaths and other stuff. Um I was like damn that is so badass. Like it's just unique. But um the other thing you're doing is you may you, you mentioned that you know, you kind of got into the reptile. Was that like a recent thing or was that like a lifelong interest of no, yours? I mean- so, um, reptile. So it's kind of funny. I've had a full-time job since I was 13. Um, but when I was in middle school, um, one of my biology teachers was like one of those like weird Bill Nye types had like, it's like one of those <laughs> teachers you remember for your whole life. And he had a whole yeah. room full of reptiles, man. And, um, so I ended up like talking to my mom to let me have a boa constrictor. And, uh, I guess like got so fascinated with it. And I was, there's this reptile shop near my house. I was just in there so much. I think the owner was just like, you know, you're, you're annoying me. It's like, why don't you start cleaning? Why don't you just get on the payroll? You're here so much, like go clean some cages. Yeah. So my first real job was working for, um, a guy who bred and imported like all kinds of exotic reptiles. And, um, I just don't ever saw, I I had a full-time reptile breeding business when I was 17 years old. Like that's where I, that's where I made my money. I was breeding snakes out of my basement and selling them all over the world. Um, so I don't, I, I don't really do it to that level anymore. I think the most I ever had was like 400. Um, Jeez. yeah, I, I, I cut way back at one point. I only had like 15. I've got about a hundred now just because I have babies I need to sell. Um, but like my normal snakes, like my collections only like 40 animals. Um, I've just done it forever. And when I moved to Florida, I'm be honest with you, I had, I'm a huge reptile guy. I'm actually like, we're leaving. Ellie and I are leaving for Indonesia in like a couple of days to go catch King mm. Cobras. Um, oh which, my gosh. I, yeah. I'm pretty pumped about that. We but, should have done the podcast after that. Yeah. Ah. We, can, we can do a follow up. Yeah. We can do but, another uh, one. <laughs> I, um, I really didn't have any intent. Like I never came down here with reptiles in my mind. It was fish, man. And, and I have a fish brain. I'll always have a fish brain. I can't help it. Like anywhere I go, the first thing I'm looking for is like, you see a stream and you're like, Ooh, like what's in there. But, um, at one point, I had caught all these exotic fish. Like, I used to, like, checking the bucket list off. Like, I did the Paku. I did the Clown Knives. I did, well, I did the Arapaima. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did all, all that stuff. And I was like, all right, man. Like, I want to see what this Python thing's about. And um, if you thought getting info from people on fish was hard, uh, getting info from people on pythons is almost impossible. That's weird uh-huh. to me. Yeah. People are really, really tight lip about it and i i want to say it's because like people are doing illegal stuff probably like Mm -hmm. not not me obviously but like some i think people are collecting um so whatever like they're looking at from a monetary standpoint i've never looked at anything fishing or outdoors related as monetary like i go to work i make my money to pay my bills the last thing i want to do is turn the things i love into my like my reptile collection is what it is because that's what i want to do if at any point in time this starts feeling like a job i'll I, i i'll sell everything until it doesn't feel like a job anymore. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to catch snakes. I was like, dude, I don't care. Like you can keep everything we find. I don't, I don't even care. I just want to find one and nobody would help me. So one night I just said, fuck it. And I bought a flashlight and I just started driving around the Everglades. Yeah. <laughs> and I like to take credit for it, but I think it's just dumb luck. I fa- I came across like a nine foot Python my very first night. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was like freaking out, caught it, brought it home, skinned it posted a bunch of stuff and in the process of me like trying to find out about the python program or like just catching them um you know there's people who are pretty high in the like the media presence mm-hmm. one of them uh was donna khalil she's like the you know the, the python lady for, like she's like the one woman who does this and she's an older woman and she catches tons of pythons and what so i like befriended her on facebook and she gave me a little bit of info um and when i caught it you know, she's like, Hey, I'm so proud of you. That's awesome. Like, you know, 
you can come be my volunteer because she was one of the contractors. That's cool. So I, I did. And what I expected to just be like me going out with her a couple of times, um, blossoming into this friendship that, I mean, like she's like, I consider her like a mother to me. I mean, she's just such a phenomenal person. Um, I went out with her all the time until I um, was lucky enough to be offered a position as one of the contractors myself. So now that is like a, a second job for me that I do. I, you know, I work for the state or them. So I, I, I'm, I'm one of the people who go out and I mean, this year alone, we've got, we're at like 130 for the year. Um, so we take it really seriously. And luckily for me, about the time Tarpon starts slowing down, that starts picking up. So yeah. <laughs> it, it works out pretty well for me to just roll right into it. But um, yeah, man, I mean, it's just such a weird taboo thing. Like it's just crazy to think about because they're, they're not even this common in Burma where they're from. I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're in the Everglades and I mean, you've seen the videos, people catch giants. We've, we've caught giants. Um, we, this year alone, you know, we dug them out of the ground on nets. So like, we dug a mm-hmm. 15 foot out of the ground on a bunch of eggs. I mean, just crazy stuff. That's, yeah, it's, you know, it's a weird thing because like, you know, when you think about Florida, people outside of Florida, you know, you, people associate this state with with staple characters of the swamp like alligators it's like you know this is the alligator state and now like there's this new this like new powerhouse reptile on the scene that's kind of be you know almost reaching the same you know when you now it's like when you think florida you think crazy reptiles and it's like now when you think florida you think oh that's the state where those giant pythons live yeah i like i don't know i guess this is like, where did it start? You, was it an accident? Or do you think this it was? was? So from what I've understood, and the, the cool thing about my position now that I actually work for the state, it's everything we do is science-based. And they're, as much as they're interested in removing the animals, they're interested in understanding what's going on with the population. You know, there's a lot, of, there's so much more science behind it than people think. It's not just rednecks running around the swamp shooting pythons. Like, there's tons of science that goes into what I do. Um, Mm -hmm. but from my understanding, it was back in like hurricane Andrew, there was, um, a large reptile facility, I guess somewhere in Homestead and it got wiped out by the hurricane and, you know, just snakes got loose and that's how it started. Cause they're, uh, they're really a super predator, man. They get big quick. I mean, they start out at 22 to 26 inches out of the egg and within a year they can be eight foot easy. They can be sexually mature and breed within like three yeah. and they can lay anywhere between 30 and a hundred eggs. And so it, 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 you know, exponentially multiplies very quickly. So over the course of like 30 years, it's become a real problem. And now they're, I don't personally believe, and this doesn't reflect, and my opinions obviously don't reflect like the agency I work for or anything, but I don't think we'll ever get rid of it. I think what we're doing now is the best possible way to help manage the problem. Um, I've seen, they've, they've tried everything. They've done like the thermal cameras and training the dogs and all this stuff. And it, it does work to a certain extent, but realistically, we're only catching the animals that are moving in the spot we're at when we're there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, th- you know, I think that's one of the things that really drew me to it was like, you know, you're a big fish guy. You, we don't go fishing. We're hunting, you know, like you're mm-hmm. hunting for a big fish. I'm not, if you're going bass, you know, I mean, guys, bass guys are the same way, but if you go to pond fishing, right. You're just there to catch a fish. Yeah. You know, I don't, it, but if you go to a pond and you're like, I know somewhere down there is a 30 pound red tail catfish. Like I'm going to catch that fit. You know, like that's, that's hunting. And that's how I view tarpon. That's how I view all big snook. You know, I'm hunting that big fish. Pythons are no different. Um, Rolls right back into the same, you use the same techniques and everything. The only difference is um, you can't really pattern pythons like you would a fish. They, you can obviously look at the weather conditions. You know, if it's a cold night, clearly a, a reptile is not going to move as much as if it's 85 degrees. Yeah. Um, but, you know, outside of weather patterns and where there's water and where there isn't, that's about it. It's, I think a lot of people have the misconception that's very easy to come down here and do. And I, I, I would beg to differ. It's actually extremely difficult and I invest a lot of time and a lot of money into doing it. And there are plenty of nights that I come home empty handed. Like it's, it's, they are very smart. They hide well, they can go weeks without moving. Uh, there it's, 
it's interesting. It's really interesting. It's it's from a reptile perspective. It's very cool. Um, not so cool to our ecosystem here, though. Like, yeah, it's, it's you know, I don't know. It's it is. It's funny you mentioned that. Like, there's definitely been some late nights where I was coming across the state, you know, down in the Everglades, and I'm like, oh, I want to pull off on some of these dirt roads and drive around and see if I can find. Well, I've never found anything. Yeah, like, but but I know damn well I'm probably near them, and I just I don't have the I don't have the vision for it. It, uh, it happens though, man. Like we go out there, and I mean, it, the more training you have, and like obviously I, I have a lot yeah. more training than a lot of people, so I, I know what to look for. I, I can mm. look and see things in grass. So, but the state record was caught crossing the road. I mean, anyone's gonna yeah. see a telephone pole laying across the road. Like it's you know it can it can happen to anyone anytime. There's I mean it's a huge adrenaline rush grabbing one of those things because they're not you know they're not friendly and they're very strong and i mean they don't want to be messed with which you know they've never seen humans before yeah it is, it, you know it's but i haven't lived in florida long enough to be like to to under to really understand the impact from a personal level mm-hmm. like i get when i go through the everglades and i don't see any raccoons like i i, I can i understand I was, but like you know when i go with elliot and he's like man like i remember being a kid out here and like there was stuff everywhere. And now there just is, you know, like I, that, that I don't relate to that as much because I wasn't here when, you know, I, I didn't see it before these things were a real problem, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a crazy thing. And you know, what's, what's bizarre. And you sort of alluded to this was uh, like how big they are. And like the state records, I followed it a little bit. Again, it's one of those things that's fun to look at. It's fun to watch. Yeah. And it makes big news every time somebody gets one, but it's like, it seems like that state record is like, rapidly being beat like i'm wondering like are they getting bigger like uh it like it, this i might be wrong here but like correct me if i'm wrong uh like i wonder if we're gonna see a day if we're not already there where the pythons in florida are even bigger than where they're native to already passed already passed insane yep yeah it's it's they are bigger here than they are in Britain. and um i have like a different side of it too because it's it's one of those things that's i'm i'm really involved in and i'm I try to learn as much as I can because I understand it from all aspects because when I lived in Ohio, when I was a full-time snake breeder, Burmese pythons were my main animal I bred. So I understand them from like the captive owning them as a pet side of things. And I understand how big they can get. If you give them everything they need to get big, they can get like a 19 foot Burmese python, which is a state record now. Yeah. That's nothing in captivity. You know, they get much bigger than that. If yeah. you feed them right. You know, over and, and it's not necessarily healthy for the animal to be fed the way they feed them in captivity to get that big, but they can get bigger. And I, I do think that um, it'll get beat again. I don't know when or why, but I don't think there'll ever be a day where we see like a 23 foot. I think I think I think we'll see a 20 foot snake in the Everglades. I think yeah. it'll happen. Um, but it's kind of like kind of like alligators, right? Where like they grow, I don't know what the role is, but like, you know, an eight foot alligator might be like 10 years old, but a 10 foot alligator is like 40 years old. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's gotta be a smart animal. And I'll tell you the, I don't know how any of that stuff survives down there with the traffic. I mean, it's horrific. There's the amount of, you know, I'm down there every night driving and just the road kills crazy. Yeah. It's bad. So, I mean, they, they learned, they learned to stay away from the roads, you know, cause they're dangerous. Well, guess where you python hunt from the roads so yeah. you got a big you got a big animal that's learned the roads are dangerous it doesn't come near them it's going to go years and years and years and years without being bothered and then maybe one day it slips up because it's mating season just like deer they're looking for a mate and it comes out on a road and someone it's a bunch of college kids jump out and grab it and then you know yeah. now, we got, <laughs> now we got a new state record so that's uh, uh, i think realistically that's that's how I, it is I, I think about two like like a 15 footer or, you know, the thing things are big as round as your leg. I can't yeah. imagine, like, if you're not paying attention driving at night, going 70 miles an hour down the highway, and you don't see it in time. Like, that's like hitting a speed bump. Yeah. Going, oh, God. Like, it kills somebody. Yeah, for Why? sure. I, I see the, the big dead alligators. So I'm like, first of all, how did you miss that? Second of all, like, where's the car? Oh, yeah. No Somebody's dead. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that too. The big, the big alligators, like the nine footers with a crushed skull. I'm like, what happened to that car? <laughs> yeah, there's you, no, they like, went there's airborne. No, like, yeah. yeah, there's no way you just kept driving. Cause like, yeah, that, you, that there's there's no way. Yeah. You don't just mush over. them. like, that's like hitting a boulder, but it's crazy. And now are they like, are they like 
bound by environmental factors like uh, like is there like a temperature threshold where they're sort of like captive by our you know it's all oh, if you go above yeah. such and such level it's going to be too cold and they won't make it or yeah i'm wondering so. how far they can really expand um I, you know i think they'll expand further north i don't know how far though i don't think they're gonna be able to make it into georgia and stuff like that because um they can survive a very brief cold spell like down to the 50s okay but they're cold blooded. And if they're exposed to that for an extended period of time, the cold won't kill them unless it's really cold. Okay. Mm-hmm. But they're going to get a respiratory infection and that is going to kill them. Uh, okay. Um, slowly. It will, you know, it won't kill them immediately, but it will kill them slowly. And so I think eventually there's going to, there's going to be some line somewhere where past X, Y, Z point is too cold for them and they can't do it. They're not, people talk about them evolving to handle the cold better and stuff like that. I mean, that, that's something that takes place over hundreds of years. Like maybe is it possible? If, yeah, sure. But it, not in our lifetime. Guys. Like that's not going to be a thing, but um, they, they're, I mean, they're found pretty far North. Um, I don't know, man, I've been seeing pictures. I can't validate any of this information. It's all on Facebook, but um, I belong to a, a snake identification group where people who just regular people, they, they see a snake in there. They can post a picture and say, Hey, what is this? Um, you know, and I, just I'm simply part of it because I'm a, a big proponent for like we don't need to kill things right like there's no yeah. the, the amount the amount of poor water snakes that have died because people told their cotton mouse and they shot them like I would rather people get educated and if I if I can help educate you great um, but every now and then man I see stuff on there that I I see through the lines and one of those is that I've been seeing uh, on a couple occasions completely unrelated people posting pictures of hashling Burmese pythons. Um, up past Inglewood, which is pretty far north. Yeah, it's up near the, yeah. the Tampa area. And um, I can't substantiate that they, they could be troll accounts or anything like that, but I'm looking at that snake and I can tell that it's not a captive born snake and that it hatched recently. It's not something that someone kept in their garage feeding in and let it go. Like that's a snake that's, you know, he's a fresh one. He's new to the world. And I've seen a couple of them where I'm like, you know, there, there could be a population up there. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, that's, that kind of goes back to, you know, I said that it was interesting when you mentioned how like tight lipped people get about it because it's like, you know, and, and even talking about the bow fishing thing, this is sort of some parallels there. It's it's weird when the intent should be total elimination of the animal. Uh, right. And, you know, I've, I've seen similar with like, like bow fishing guys who are shooting carp. But I could go to the same group of people like, yeah, that's right. We need to get rid of these terrible invasive carp. So what's uh, what's your hot spot? I ain't going to tell you that. So, so you don't actually want them gone. Yeah. That's your own personal yeah. like thing. So it's like, okay, well, this, the same, I don't know, this, like the same uh, frame of mind that you would protect your quarry may also spawn off creating new quarries. And that's what makes me wonder is like, how did they spread that rapidly? Unless maybe like, you know, I don't know. My mind's wondering, but see, you got to think like I, if I, you if you can if it's something you can make money off of, it just behooves you in an expansion so open where it's easy to hide to farm things. Well, that's that's what happened with the chameleons. Like I know you and I've been chameleon hunting and stuff like that. They um, yeah, people set up these like breeding populations of the chameleons, right? And their intent was to come back a year or two later, collect all the babies and sell them. Yeah, which is exactly what happened. But what they were counting on was the fact that chameleons just lay eggs until they die and they just explode. And they essentially oversaturated the market where there's so many chameleons available that the, it isn't monetarily makes sense to go out and collect them anymore. So yeah. then they just don't. And then you and I can come out on a Saturday night and walk down some canals on the back of my neighborhood and catch chameleons. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, why would I even bother trying to sell something like that? It's gonna, I'm going to be able to sell for maybe $3 a lizard. If I, you know, wanted to go through all the steps and processes to get the license, you know what I'm saying? It's just so much work that no one wants to bother with it. So now we have the problem. The the difference is that chameleons aren't causing any issues. They're just coexisting. Right. And like, I don't know if you remember that whole scenario um, with those, those bow fishing guys that came down to Ida and slaughtered all those clown knives. Yeah. Yeah. I saw some posts on that. Yeah. Right. And like, that's one of those things where if you don't live here, it's hard to understand the scenario with the pythons, the exotic fish and stuff. Cause right. They, you know, they come down here and I don't know what their intent was. I mean, clearly their intent was to make a clickbait video. Um, 
you know, they come down to all oh, these are invasive fish. We got to get them out, blah, 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 blah. And then they bow fish, you know, an entire boatload of clown knife fish. Um, and it wasn't, uh, it w- the locals didn't take kindly to it. Um, right. <laughs> they did not get the overwhelming, you know, uh, I guess audience they expect they're going to. People were threatening to shoot them and, you know, cut their tires and steal their boat and all that stuff. Because that's, as you know, that's one of those fish where it's, it's not supposed to be here, but it's, it's coexisting and it's a very unique thing to hear. And there are people who make a living guiding for them. And, yeah. you know, it's like, is that something we should really be focused on eliminating? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't know these things, but I can tell you from my experience as an angler that um, from what I can tell, they're just coexisting, right? Like, I yep. mean, if, if there's no lack of bait, I mean, God, my God, you go out there and fish for them for shiners. The biggest bass I've caught in Florida, I caught, fishing for clown knives it looked like a football like clearly that fish is not struggling to eat alongside yeah. those clown knives so i don't know yeah yeah i don't know it's just it's a, it's uh it's a weird pythons color. are not that way though like pythons are a clear problem they're yeah they're, they're causing real and, and i've said this you know once it's a big problem now i i wonder what will happen when it starts becoming a thing where they're eating burrowing owls or yeah. like you know someone finds a cougar cub in a belly of a yeah. black you know what i'm saying like then what happens because yeah. like, you know i don't know they're, i they're, think they're, uh, i think you're right it's this it's one of those things where it's like man it, they're never gonna go anywhere the best you can bet and best you can hope for is control measures like just control just control what's already there minimize or slow down the damage but you know you see these videos too or I don't remember. I don't remember how I stumbled across this one. I guarantee you've seen this. You know, you're in this world, so I know you see everything that probably. But I, yeah. I remember I saw a video a while back. It was like, it was uh somebody has like exposing these uh, influencer types with catching oh, that's pythons. My videos. Yeah, yeah, Ca- yeah, yeah, catching these pythons, and you know that they, you know, they got crazy patterns and colors, but they're uh, it's like fingerprints. They all have very identifiable patterns. And there was, I watched this video where it was the same snake, the same python, and like five different videos just being hoed around between these influencers. Oh, yep. found a snake in the toilet. Oh, found a snake under my bed. Oh, found a snake in the storm drain. Same damn snake every time. Yep. And it's I, like, it's, okay, it's, so we're uh, moving. We're definitely moving things around. And, you know, and that's, that's why, that exact reason is why, um, you know, the, the, I always get asked questions from the public of like, I want to go python hunting. Like, let's sh- how do I do this? You know, and I always explain to them, like, there are certain areas of the state where anyone can go catch a python if you see one. Mm-hmm. The rule is, though, you can't transport them alive. And this yeah. that's the exact reason, right? Because, like, number one, that's just animal abuse. Like, that animal, like, you know, although they're not supposed to be here, they're still living creatures. You yeah. should not be treating them wrong. Like, that, that animal is just getting abused. It's not getting fed, watered, or anything. They're just pissing it off for videos and passing it around like that's right. animal. <laughs> um but also that's why the state you know is well it doesn't let just anyone go catch pythons and do what they want with them because that's that's how new populations arise and stuff so you know i'm we're all you know there's a lot of scrutiny under what i do and it's very specific what i how i have to do it yeah and there's a reason for that and i and i agree with it and i understand it it's but it's also hard for me to give other people advice on python hunting because I have acts. I, I hunt places where the public can't go, so I can't. You know yeah. what works for me isn't going to work for you because you know you can't go there. Yeah. So. Well, I get it. I kind of understand that. Like you know, you think like, oh, well, why don't they just open the floodgates and have open season and just let everybody go down there? You know, while that initially that sounds like oh, it'd be great if there's just more people out there to take them out. Well, then you got to wonder how many doofuses are going to be out there killing native snakes because they don't. They don't. Oh know. yeah. Yeah, that's a well, that's a huge problem. Good. And uh, you know, the, I will say that they they do the the Python tournament every year for uh, everyone to come down in like the one week. Um, mm-hmm. Pretty cool. You get a lot of people from a lot of different places coming down here to to hunt pythons, um, and they go through this like very specific orientation of like what you can and can't do. Like you're not to touch native stuff. There's a number for you to call if you have questions whether what you have is a python. You know, I'm just like they they're very well put together but they make you go to that orientation before you can go do it. Right. Like you have to, so there's like some structure to it. It would be very different if it was just, was like, you know, open season. And then, you know, you, you run the risk of, you know, people just doing a lot, you know, anytime there's a chance to make money, I'm convinced someone will find a, a way to illegally do it. 
So uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's it's just you gotta you gotta be very careful in those kind of situations. That's another reason I don't really associate with too many people because I I do my best to not get involved in any of that. You know, I'm fishing wise or otherwise. You know, I, yeah. I think we, we live in a, a weird state where, you know, how much trespassing fishing did you do in Oklahoma? Oh gosh, it's actually if you see a no trespassing sign in Oklahoma, you actually have to like abide by it because the people out there, exactly. i don't know it, it's scary i didn't do a lot of it there exactly how much here, did you do down here I, honestly i came here with the same mindset because of where i came from so i didn't do a lot and then i kind of realized that, that they're just i don't know i don't want to yeah. <laughs> i don't want to incriminate myself but right. it seems it's, like those signs just are very it's devalued totally, around it's totally here. different yeah they it's are. just it's, it's totally different down here yeah and uh it's it's hard to explain or understand that if you're not in this world that like some things are okay even though they don't seem like they're not okay. However, yeah. that doesn't always relate to everything. Like, yeah. No trespassing a, a, a neighborhood pond to catch a fish is one thing. No trespassing government land to look for snakes. Totally different. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> one's going to get you, uh, you need to go home. The other one, you're going to go to jail. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get that. I don't know, man. People around here trounce around, do whatever they can to be a viral sensation. And, and, and you know, the same guys that I saw in the videos with the snakes, are the same ones that own like the little the little koi pond pools in the backyard full of crazy exotic fish, and then you scroll a couple of thumbnails down, and there they are catching that same kind of fish at the nearby oh, pond. Yeah, I'm, like, yeah. I'm like, hell, you're moving these these fish are just your Instagram models. They're just your it's, they're, uh, they're just your YouTube models. What is this? I learned I learned that lesson. When it I is a here. mental illness. I think it's I, literally I, a I sickness. Agree. I agree because like when I first moved down here. No one, I didn't, I didn't do it in Ohio. I didn't really, there, I don't think there's enough things in Ohio that you could possibly do that with outside of like lying about where you catch fish, which everyone's going to do anyway. So that is what yeah. it is. But, um, I moved down here and I see these influencers catching all this crazy stuff. And I started like comparing myself to them, right? Like yeah. measuring what I do up to them. And like, I would have been, okay, I'm definitely smarter. I'm as good of an angler. Why am I not able to do these things? I don't understand. And then I started slowly realizing that, like, it's not all as it seems. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of stuff that uh, is fabricated for social media. You know, I don't know. I just I, I've seen it on all on, on all fronts. But like, you know, for me, the big one was like the red tail catfish. Like, I yeah. couldn't understand why I can't find a red tail catfish and like how hard I've tried. There's definitely places you can go to catch them. I just haven't been lucky enough, but there are definitely people who just have a pond that they're catching their own pets <laughs> from, you know, bizarre. So. I don't know, man, T to each their own, I guess there's no real harm done other than being annoying. And hell, yeah. if that's, a, if that's all you're really doing, no, nope, no big deal. So, but, uh, but anyway, dude, so like, you know, as we kind of winded down a little bit on time, we've sort of talked about where you came from, where you're at now. And then like, I'm always love to know like where, what people have got going on next. I had seen one of your posts. Again, I get to see it. Other people don't, if your stuff's private, but I saw where you'd been in, uh, Costa Rica or somewhere, photos yeah. of tapir, different types of snakes. It's like, I know you're making these like, you're starting to launch these campaigns now when like guys of our age bracket start just being bold and being spontaneous i love that stuff it's like why are more yeah. pe more people need to be out going and getting uncomfortable and going and having a level of uncertainty in their life and going and doing something unique not watching it on a video but um just tell me a little bit real quick i want because I, i'm interested i didn't I had no idea you're going to chase Freaking King Cobra's next. Yeah, man. Give me, give me big, the rundown uh, on the trip before, because you got to be excited yeah. about that. I'm a big proponent of what I call tight B fun. Like in the moment, it might suck a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> when you look back on it, you're gonna make like, man, that's one hell of a trip. I'm um. So we're going to Indonesia essentially for. I'm going for two weeks. Um, Elliot's staying for a week longer to do some diving. I'm actually not dive certified, so I there's just no point in me hanging around. Um, Indonesia is really weird on fishing. Like you can fish Indonesia, but there's a lot of rules and regulations to it. And I'm not sure how that works yet. I would like to fish around there, but I need to get there before I can figure out. But, um, we're essentially going to Bali starting off to look for King Cobras. Um, it's King Cobra nesting season. Um, just like anywhere else in the world, habitat destruction is happening over there too. And, uh, it's something I really want to see in the wild before, you know, it's not a thing anymore. 
Uh, and then we're going to be leaving from there to go to Sumatra to still live in the jungle for about a week. I'm a little nervous about that one because that's about as, you know, Bali's still a civilization in yeah. infrastructure. Sumatra does not. That is <laughs> as wild as it gets. Um, we're going to go look for orangutans and see what other kind of trouble we can get into. But I'm, a, I'm, you know, when I first moved down here, everything was brand new to me. So I really didn't have a whole lot of, you know, aspiration to, to go anywhere else because everything was still like I, I had it right here. Why would I? Yeah, now that I've been here and not that I don't love it and not that I'm not going to change what I'm doing. But now I'm starting to get that bug where it's like, you know, the next adventure. You know, I want to go. We're, I'm going back to uh, to Thailand in December um, with my wife. Where it's, our, where it's actually going to be our honeymoon. Oh, cool. um, we're okay. going to do a bunch of diving and stuff. And then um, I want to go back to the Amazon. That's that's the next one. I think I think you might beat me there, though. You get this feeling when you go places like that, that you're you're just everything's different. It's it's like you're on a different planet. People yeah. are different. The smells are different. Even the, even the heat, is, the, everything is so different. Um, you really feel like completely on another planet. It's incredible. Like the sounds you're going to hear, the things you're going to see, not to mention the fish you're going to catch, just going to be out of this yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely at that point now where I'm like, I need to start doing things now and just not like worried about, oh, one day I'll do this. And it's like, no, it, it has to happen now. I leave on the ninth, man. We're like, we're going to be gone. I can't, nice. we're going to both come back. We're going to have some wild stories to tell each other. Yeah. So I'm um, super sorry. We got to, we have to freaking get together and plan a trip soon. It can, it can be a foreign country, but, I, or just alligator gar. Cause I still, I still got to knock that one off my yeah. list, man. Well, anyway, I guess we'll start wrapping things up. I'm, I'm excited yeah, to yeah. see what happens in Borneo. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and just where you're going, like King Cobra. Like when you were saying that, I was just like laughing because I think you know you, you, I hear a lot about people going to Bali. People go to Bali all the time, like yeah. to, to, to sip tea and look out over the canopy. <laughs> you're going yeah. there to look for King Cobras. I'm like Jesus. Like you, you know, yeah. you don't hear that that often. I mean, people people plan vacations to travel. It ain't to go look for a monkey in the forest or orangutans and. But it's so admirable, and it's like it's so rare. Especially guys like us. I don't know, man. Like I, I still consider us young, but people yeah, just oh, aren't. For sure. I feel people young, aren't for sure. doing this stuff. People are not doing these things, and it blows my mind because it's like. And you should be, because like yeah. you know, I'm in that weird spot, and I, I talk about this a lot. Where like I'm a nurse, I work in a hospital. Like you're not, you don't come to see me on your best day. Mm -hmm. Like the people I'm seeing are not like that. It's not a good time for them. Yeah, and you know, I talk to these people they're my, you know, they're my patients man and, and nobody nobody talks about the boat they bought or the truck they bought or how many houses they have they talk about that fishing trip they took with their best friend who died 10 years ago or you know yeah. what their their family they like they talk about like the life experiences that's just really in these past couple of years especially for me like i've always i've always had that adventure drive i go all over the place but like it's really like tuned it up for me where i'm like i i understand now like what's important in life. I think a little more than maybe I did before. I was more worried about making a lot of money and having the hundred thousand dollar boat and all that stuff. Now I'm like, no, nah, I want to, I want to go see the things that there are to see before they're not there anymore. I want to go catch the fish and see the jungles and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. That's a, uh, that's very interesting. It's funny that you mentioned that I even had jotted it down, but just didn't cover it. But uh, you're like the fifth guy I've had on here. That's does that line of work. There's like something yeah. to it. There's something about being first responders in general or working at, you know, any job function where you kind of get the front row seat to somebody's worst day and, and it, 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 it's every day, multiple times per day. Yeah. And, uh, and I got a little bit of that in law enforcement. It's like, man, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. It's kind of sad, but it also, boy, I like the guys that I know that do that, like all of them is like fishing is there, like, mode to reset and it's like it, yeah. they get this opportunity to get deep perspectives and then go and like i don't know somehow it somehow it manifests itself into this awesome experiences in in the wild i had uh um, i think i think for me it's kind of strange because like you know you hear about ptsd and you hear about you know the first thing that comes to mind obviously is like military and the soldiers which is totally valid understood then you think about cops and you think about firemen right like that's also validated but as a nurse, I see horrible things all yeah. the time, right? And, and my job requires me to be mentally sharp all the time. Like, I don't have the opportunity to, like, just kind of zone out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always in that mode. But, like, you move that to the fishing and the outdoors. Like, I'm always still in that mode. But now it, it, it's, like, a totally different feeling for me. Instead of it being, like, 
a, a necessity of life. Now it's like, this is a necessity for my happiness. Like I'm doing this for yeah. me. And it, it just like, it fuels me to do it even more. And I think that's kind of like, I don't like being sedentary. I don't like being lazy. Like I don't really want to sit around and watch TV all the time. Like, of course there's a time and place for that, but like, if I got the day off and the weather's nice, like I want to go explore or do something. Like I want to go put that kind of energy into something else that like is just enjoyable. I think you gotta really find that balance. And, and I know a lot of people want to find more of that balance in, in your life. And I think a lot of that, you know, there's sacrifices. Like I wanted a, a career where I could kind of make my days and make my schedule and have the time to do it. But you know, my, my career is definitely not all sunshine and rainbows. Like I have, I, I, every day I go to work is a hard day, you know, yeah. not saying, not saying other people don't, you know, they definitely do, but that's, that's the trade off for being able to, to schedule myself the way I do. And it doesn't really matter anyways, because we're so short staffed on here. I still, I still work 60 hours yeah. a week. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good in theory. Now it's just uh, I, work that's the, I have all the respect for the people who do that. I can't tell you how many <laughs> times I transported somebody to the hospital and like dropped off a problem. It's like, oh, I'm glad that's on y'all now. It's like it gets even worse from here. But um, you know, I'm not. I'm not even kidding. Like as we have just having this conversation, I'm using my phone. I saw the notification from my hospital drop down asking me to come in tomorrow because we're short set. Like I mean, it's just it is what it is. You know. Doesn't help. There's a big storm out there, and people probably aren't driving smart, and everybody's having yeah. panic attacks. But Dylan, man, I appreciate your time. This was like a very, <laughs> this was like as good as I wanted it to be. Like there's so much to cover with a guy like you, with the reptiles, the moves, the international trips, the uh, trips within the same nation. But yeah, you couldn't have gone any further from Florida to you know literally the Pacific yeah. Northwest, just polar opposite ends of the country. But um, yeah, dude, I can't, I, I can't wait, man. I can't wait to hear about your trip. And we're, we're definitely gonna have to get back together yeah. here soon. And just we are way stuff. overdue for a fishing trip. Like we did the chameleon yeah. thing. That's fun. That's cool. But like we're, no, we're we anglers, to, you know what I mean? And we need to, yeah. we need to go do something serious. I got to get you on a Python too, because you got to get that picture. So we got, yeah. we got to, yeah, that's another one that see the, for me, these are one and done type of things. So yeah. you don't got to worry about me coming to your Python spot and be like, gotcha. Yeah. I'm about to no, bring no, no, all no, my no. friends no, now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I wanna, but it's it's funny though because like I'm gonna I'm gonna I got, I got the whole rig on my truck. Like we're gonna go to like the, yeah. the spot and we're gonna get you a good one. So well, seriously, we, let's 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 get something like that planned. I don't want to just move yeah. off of you though. I got to figure out what I can offer in return, or we just meet no. on we just meet on neutral ground and go chase something different together. When we have to figure out the puzzle together. Uh, man, but, I, I, would, I would love nothing more, man. Just yep. your, your friendship alone is enough for me. Yep. So. Well, dude, I know that your, your Instagram and stuff is, is, is buttoned up and tightened up, but maybe people who are listening want to see some of these things, the pythons, we didn't even get into some of the hunts, the hog hunting doll kinds of crazy stuff you do with the fish. But uh, if somebody yeah. wanted to like, see you that can, stuff, where, where can, can they also, find you can, it? You can still go to my Instagram. It's, um, it's danger. Dylan. Like I, I still accept people. I just leave yeah. it private simply because some of the stuff I do, I don't want, random news stations and stuff just grab i i just don't really want to wake up one day and see my face on the news again it's already happened once and be like oh no <laughs> where, who got that and where they get it from so yeah that's it but yeah you're, you're more welcome to send me a friend request if you're a, a, a fishy guy i'm sure we'll have s something in common you guys are more than welcome to check my page out yep well, awesome man i appreciate getting you on here and we'll be in touch i'm sure we're, we're local boys we don't live too far away so no we'll, not at we'll, all we'll be in touch but all right man you have a good I one, all right? It. And stay safe yeah. with all this weather. You got it, buddy. Take care. Thank you for listening to Boundless Pursuit. Tune in each week as we bring stories and insight from uniquely talented anglers and outdoorsmen. And if you enjoyed this show, I want to hear from you. Be sure to leave a five-star review as this is going to drive the growth and exposure of this show. And if you have feedback or guest suggestions, I would love to hear from you. And you can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com. For all other collections of media and contact information, please visit www.boundless-pursuit.com.